Good afternoon. We continue today with the next item of business, a stage one debate on motion 15055 in the name of Jean Freeman on the Health and Care Staffing Scotland Bill. I would encourage all members who wish to contribute in this afternoon's debate to press their request to speak buttons now. And I call on the Cabinet Secretary, Jean Freeman, to speak to and move the motion. Thank you, Presiding Officer. <clears throat> the people of Scotland rightly expect safe, effective and person-centred health care. Ensuring that we all have continuing and improved access to the right care at the right time has been the guiding principle of our approach to health and social care services. But this is a significant and complex task. In common with healthcare systems elsewhere in the world, we are living longer but not yet healthier lives. That brings the challenge of more complex health conditions to more of our citizens. In meeting the increasing demand on our services, it is essential that we act to make sure our whole system of health and care has the capacity, focus and workforce to address the needs of our changing society. I have set out my expectations for improved mental health services, improved access through the Waiting Times Improvement Plan and continuing pace in the reform of our health and social care services underpinned by improvements in primary care. But these can only be secured through the hard work and dedication of our health and care staff. There is a compelling argument that having sufficient staff working in a psychologically safe environment is integral to good patient outcomes. That is why we need to put measures in place to ensure that at all times we have evidence-based safe levels of staff. The Health and Care Staffing Bill is grounded in and builds on the excellent approach to workload planning led by our nurses and midwives. The development of the staffing methodology and speciality specific tools has been an innovative, evidence-based and importantly, a professionally led approach. An approach that has led to their use in the Welsh legislation on safe staffing and in the development of workload tools used by NHS England. Recognising its value, we made a manifesto commitment to secure this approach in legislation. This bill now goes further than that commitment. It puts in place a framework to systematically identify the workload needed to approve outcomes and deliver high quality care. In developing this bill, we carried out two consultations and held 10 public events. My officials, my predecessor and I have worked with representatives of nurses, doctors, allied health professionals, health boards, local authorities, care service providers, professional bodies, trade unions and others to take the principles of an approach that works in one part of our health and care system and enable the spread of that across the whole system. Throughout, we have worked hard to listen to ideas and views and look at how we can make this work. I recognise that there can be competing interests, that our integration agenda is ambitious and that the approach the Bill encapsulates will require a significant cultural shift in our health and care organisations. We saw this reflected in the evidence taken by the Health and Sport Committee. But I believe that throughout it has also been clear that this Bill is an opportunity. It's an opportunity to enable a rigorous evidence-based approach to decision-making on staffing that takes account of patients and service users' health and care needs. It will identify the workload required to deliver those needs, assist the exercise of professional judgment and promote a safe environment. It's an opportunity to ensure that the professional judgment of our staff delivering health and social care is heard. It's an opportunity to create transparency around staffing decisions. Transparency, which aids Health Improvement Scotland, Healthcare Improvement Scotland, and the Care Inspectorate to support improvement across our health and care services and giving staff and patient, patients the confidence that at all times decisions are made around staffing for safe, effective, and person centred care. Healthcare Improvement Scotland and the Care Inspectorate will play a crucial role in the implementation of this approach. Both will be responsible for facilitating the development of staffing tools and methodologies in collaboration with the services who will use them. In doing so, this will identify, develop and implement continuous quality improvement rather than focus solely 
on compliance against minimum standards. Giving uh, his a specific function on the face of the bill has been raised, and I will bring forward an amendment at stage two to make the role of his absolutely clear. The bill puts in place a methodology and procedures to ensure that health boards and care service providers ensure that they have appropriate staffing. What it is not about is nurses alone, nor is it about setting a minimum number of staff to deliver any particular service. It is founded on the innovative approach our nurses and midwives have developed, which starts with a robust evidence-based assessment of the care the people using our services need and want. Only once we understand that can we be sure that we understand the workload, the skills necessary to meet that workload, and to know what staff need to have in place to deliver that care to a high quality. The voice of the professional must be heard as part of this process. The increased transparency the bill requires will make obvious the workload that exists and the corresponding skills required to deliver high quality care. This assures health boards, Healthcare Improvement Scotland, the Care Inspectorate, health and care staff, professional bodies, trade unions, this chamber and the a cabinet secretary and importantly the public that we have the right staff with the right skills in place. And, and I believe that is exactly the right thing to do. Yes, of course. Monica Lennon. I'm grateful to the, the Cabinet Secretary. I agree that it's important that, that staff are listened to. Recent figures revealed that there have been one million um, stress-related absences. That's one million days in the last three years within the NHS that not covering social care. What is the Scottish Government doing now uh, out with this bill to, to address that, to make sure that the concerns that staff have now about safety and pressure in the workplace is being addressed in real time? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I'm grateful uh, to Ms Lennon to raise this matter. I know she's raised it before and like her, I take stress related indeed any absence very seriously indeed in our health service. There are a number of measures that our boards are putting in place in terms of uh, mental health support for staff. Of course, we need to recognise that all stress arises from workplace issues. Sometimes it can arise from personal or domestic issues, but nonetheless impact on an individual's uh, performance and uh, enjoyment of their work um, and so the measures that we're beginning to put in place across our health boards uh, do doesn't distinguish uh, but simply says uh, how can we help staff uh, undertake to do that. I'm happy to give Ms Lennon more detail on that matter and to discuss further with her if she would wish uh, how we might improve on that itself. It's clear from my conversations with representatives of staff groups that the bill could be improved by placing a more explicit duty on health boards to ensure there are clear mechanisms for day-to-day -day assessment of staff needs and clear routes for the professional voice to be heard in those assessments. So I'm pleased to confirm that I will bring forward an amendment at stage two to include this. The effective application of this legislation will also support the wider workforce planning processes by providing that evidence-based information on workload at a local and service level Planning the workforce needs locally, regionally and nationally will be enhanced. I know that each and every profession contributes, if you don't mind, I'll come back to you. Um, I know that each and every profession contributes to the delivery of positive outcomes for service users. And that is why this legislation applies across all staff groups delivering health and social care services. The general duty to ensure appropriate staffing and overarching principles which span all staff groups, not just nursing and midwifery. This will support multidisciplinary planning and service delivery and will also mitigate the risks of unintentionally diverting resources towards nursing and midwifery at the expense of any other staff group. Yep. Alice Cole Hamilton. Very grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for uh, giving way. Um, whilst this bill is very worthy, it is nothing without adequate workforce planning underpinning it. We can't legislate to make staffing safer and expect it just to happen. Can she confirm, can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that this uh, move towards the methodologies and toolkits described in the bill won't see staff moved out of non-acute services to make sure we're staffed safely in acute services? Cabinet Secretary. Yes, I can confirm that because the bill itself as a method, as a uh, legislative framework around a methodology is, as I am in the middle of saying, 
applying to all staff groups across health, across health and social care. To do anything other would indeed be to risk those unintended consequences of moving a resource from one area at the expense of another. And absolutely workforce planning is critical, but good workforce planning is based on sound evidence. And this is, as I will come on to say later, one of the important components of producing that sound evidence at a local and at a service level, feeding into uh, health boards workforce planning, but also IJBs and through them international workforce planning. In taking this broader approach, the bill achieves legislative coherence across the health and social care landscape. Coherence that is demanded by integrated health and social care and which rests on the important recognition of value across all staff groups. It is, as I've just said, another lever to join up services, support innovation and redesign, and deliver sustainable, high-quality care. In taking this broader approach, the legislation will not be restrictive or prescriptive, but will be appropriate and enabling for the social care sector, and in particular, support the direction of travel set out in the co-produced part two of the National Health and Social Care Workforce Plan. Any new tools and methodologies would be developed specifically for and by the professionals who will use them. The current suite of tools will not remain unchanged, but will continue to be reviewed and renewed to effectively support multidisciplinary approaches to the delivery of care. We are taking a multidisciplinary approach where that is appropriate, and I will again look to amend the bill at stage two to make that clear. This government is committed to ensuring Scotland has the appropriate staffing for the delivery of safe, high-quality care. The bill will contribute to this aim by placing a duty on health boards and care services to ensure appropriate numbers of suitably trained staff are in a place to provide safe and high-quality care. It requires health boards to apply evidence-based and professional-led approaches to nursing and midwifery workforce planning. It promotes a continuing culture of transparency and engagement with staff and facilitates the future development of this approach across health and care settings, with tools being developed through partnership and taking account of the size and the complexity of the services. I believe that we can all agree that the framework offered by the bill to put in place the right numbers of staff in the right place at the right time and with the right skills is the right thing to do. I believe presiding officer, that so far I have addressed many of the issues raised by the Health and Sport Committee in their Stage 1 report. I welcome their support for the general principles of this bill, and I want to take this opportunity to thank the committee for their full consideration of the complexity of this approach, especially in the integrated landscape, and in particular for their view, which I most assuredly share, that the professional voice must be heard at all levels. But of course, I know and acknowledge we are not all in agreement on every part of this bill. And I've welcomed the challenges and the constructive discussion we've had so far. I will commit to continuing to work with those who deliver health and social care and with members both on the committee and in this parliament to do all that we can to make sure we have the right statutory basis for the provision of appropriate staffing in health and care service settings. I think this is an ambitious piece of legislation which will provide a critical contribution to driving the necessary and important cultural and organisational change we need to meet the challenges and the expectations on health and social care in Scotland, all with the paramount objective of providing improved, safe, effective and person-centred service and outcomes for people in Scotland. And I move that the Parliament agrees to the general principles of the Health and Care Staffing Scotland Bill. Thank you very much. I now call on Lewis MacDonald as the convener to speak on behalf of the Health and Sport Committee. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer, and I am pleased to report as convener of the Health and Sport Committee on Stage 1 of the Health and Care Staffing Bill. Our report was agreed unanimously across all parties and makes a number of what we hope are constructive suggestions to enhance the bill. I would like to start by thanking all who assisted the committee with our scrutiny, uh, those who responded to our call for views and our survey, those who gave oral evidence, and the many staff who participated in our plenary session at the NHS anniversary event in Glasgow in the summer. 
Many frontline health and care staff gave up time and very busy schedules to engage with the committee, and I want to record our thanks not only for their invaluable input, but of course also for the very important work that they do. The Cabinet Secretary responded in writing to our report yesterday. Her offer to keep the dialogue going uh, is very welcome, uh, and so indeed are the commitments she's made this afternoon on areas uh, where the government intends to bring forward amendments at stage two. However, the accompanying responses indicated that there are still a number of areas and a number of specific points uh, we have made where the government has yet to be persuaded. Persuasion is, of course, what committees are all about, and I will lay out some of those areas where I hope ministers will think again. As the Cabinet Secretary has said, the Bill seeks to ensure more integrated workload and staff planning across health and care. The question for the committee has been whether it will ensure appropriate staffing levels to deliver high quality care in both health and social care settings. Part one of the Bill establishes the guiding principles for staffing. These apply to the Bill as a whole and the committee agrees that those principles should work to ensure equity and parity across all staff groups. Most of the evidence supported those guiding principles and few would argue with the aim of providing safe and high quality services. The bill will, as has been indicated, replace existing methods for assessing the adequacy of staffing levels. Now, professional judgment is part of the current staffing methodology. It is not yet uh, part of the bill. And we heard pleas that the input of professional judgment should be much more prominent uh, on the face of the legislation. Workplace leaders are best placed to take decisions on what staffing requirements are on any given day and whether there are enough suitably qualified staff on duty to meet patient needs. The committee agreed, of course. That's cool, Hamilton. Very grateful to Lewis MacDonald for giving away. Does he agree with me that um, the professional voice is not just important when it comes to safe staffing, but actually the best ideas for best practice can stem from the ward level and be disseminated outwards as best practice for the whole country? Lewis MacDonald. Absolutely agree with that, and I think it's fair to say that the approach the committee has taken to this legislation and other things has been to seek as broad an input uh, from professional groups as possible. And I hope that that will be the approach taken both by NHS management and by the government in taking forward uh, this bill. Uh, work, we, as, as, I, as I said a moment ago, we, we agreed that uh, the bill should reflect existing practice and give a prominent role to professional judgment. And we also concluded that the judgment of allied health professionals and social care workers, as well as the judgments of nurses and midwives, should be considered in order to achieve equity and parity across services. Clearly, all staff groups involved in delivering care should be involved. The government's policy memorandum says that high quality care requ requires the right people in the right place with the right skills at the right time to ensure the best health and care outcomes for service users and people using care. We can all clearly agree with that. Our report suggests that the, we, the, clarifying the role of professional judgment should be part of the bill and strengthening the commitment to staff well-being in the provision of safe and high quality services as well. So I was pleased a few moments ago to hear the Cabinet Secretary commit uh, to bring forward an amendment in this area at stage two. Many of our witnesses from the caring professions asked for these principles to be made clear on the face of the bill. Those changes would not weaken the bill. In the committee's view, they would strengthen it. Although the government believes the bill will support increased integration of health and social care services, and that's a desirable outcome, providing a consistent framework for staff planning across the sector, we did also hear evidence, considerable evidence, of concerns that it could inadvertently have the opposite effect. Some witnesses suggested that the bill is at risk of separating out health and social care and of not including significant groups of staff. That could imply that different expectations would continue to apply to different parts of a system which the government and all of us in other contexts say should be seen as a whole. We also heard concerns that the bill was very much process focused, at odds with the priority of the integration agenda of providing better outcomes for patients. We are keen to ensure that the bill's focus on process would not be at the expense of outcomes. And uh, we would take the view that, uh, that that should be in the general principles of the bill. And the government's response accompanying the Cabinet Secretary letter said that an outcome focus in the general principles of the bill would represent unnecessary duplication. I was surprised uh, to read that, and I'm sure the Minister will uh, think further about that be before stage two. 
Jane Freeman also mentioned healthcare improvement Scotland. It is undertaking work as part of its excellence in care approach to provide information on expected staffing levels and actual staffing levels by ward. This is now happening uh, in some places. And the committee agrees that it is a good idea to roll out this initiative uh, nationwide. And again, we would encourage the minister and the government uh, to consider uh, whether that could not be done. Part two of the bill applies the general principles to NHS staffing in particular. Health boards are already required to do workforce planning and to ensure the provision of high quality care. To support these duties, a suite of 12 workforce planning tools has been developed and as we've heard, they have been developed over a period of time since 2004. The committee decided that we should survey health boards to find out about the use of existing tools and we found out that the use of existing tools was patchy. Now boards have been subject to a mandatory requirement by the Scottish Government to use those tools since 2013, but that has clearly failed to have the desired effect. The bill would replace a mandatory requirement with a statutory requirement, and we asked the Government how that change would deliver compliance in future. Now the Cabinet Secretary's written response this week has noted that a number of measures are already in place to monitor Health Board's compliance with the legal duties, and suggests that no change to monitoring therefore will, will be required. It is frankly difficult to square that with the current inconsistency in compliance and it would be useful to hear more about how a statutory duty will differ in practice from a mandatory requirement. Although the workforce planning tools have been in use for up to 14 years, we also heard concerns around levels of training provided. Witnesses were keen that staff should have dedicated time to attend training rather than be expected to acquire expertise as part of continuous professional development. And again, it would be useful to know uh, if the government agrees with that. Part three of the bill relates to staffing in care services. The policy memorandum notes the purpose of including care services in the legislation is to allow the sector to build on and strengthen existing statutory mechanisms to create a cohesive framework across all health and care settings. And the bill provides a power for the care inspectorate to develop workforce planning tools for application in care settings where a need is identified and agreed. Much of the evidence we heard on part three of the bill questioned whether the bill was actually necessary in social care services. These are clearly provided in very different environments from hospital settings and we recognise that this uh, must be factored into the development of any new, any new tools. However, we concluded that the care sector should not be treated differently uh, from the NHS. In both, we should expect enough suitably qualified staff to be present to deliver high quality services and patients and their families will expect no less. The government made clear to the committee that the staffing methodologies in the bill are not linked directly to national workforce planning, although the National Health and Social Care Workforce Plan is mentioned throughout and indeed was mentioned uh, by the Cabinet Secretary this afternoon. Other witnesses were concerned about how the outcomes of the bill could be achieved without a firmer link to wider national workforce planning. If there is insufficient labour, skilled labour available nationally to fill vacancies, health boards and care services may be unable to meet the requirements of the bill. We need to know, and they need to know, what would then follow if that's the case. One concern raised was the possible skewing of resources away from social care at the time when tools exist only in the NHS. Staff and other resources might be concentrated in the acute sector in order to meet the statutory requirements under part two of the bill, while tools are still under development for social care under part three. And a similar issue was raised by allied health professionals who were concerned that directors of finance could be put in an invidious position when it came to deciding priorities. Funding might go to the nursing side, for example, at the expense of AHPs and of multidisciplinary working. We need to ensure those fears are not realized by ensuring that the essential role of AHPs is reflected in this legislation, particularly for the early years before part three of the bill comes fully into effect. And again, an amendment at stage two, as was indicated by this cabinet secretary today, uh, would be widely welcomed. In closing, presiding officer, the committee unanimously supports the general principles of the bill while seeking clarification on the issues we have raised and a positive response uh, to the concerns we have highlighted in our report. Many of the witnesses to our stage one inquiry were looking for reassurance that the government was listening to their concerns. So I hope the Cabinet Secretary will reflect further on our report on this debate and on the concerns raised by witnesses so that we can see the bill 
made much stronger and better at stage two. Thank you. Thank you. I now call on Miles Briggs to open for the Conservative Party to be followed by Monica Lennon. Miles Briggs. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to start by thanking all the organisations which have provided useful briefings ahead of today's uh, debate. The most vulnerable, valuable resource of any uh, organisation is its people, and our Scottish NHS is no different. There are over 162,000 NHS employees across Scotland who work tirelessly day in, day out to deliver and support he our health and social care services for the people of our country. The question they are asking is this, what exactly will this bill do to help support those working in Scotland's health and social care settings? And for me, and I know for members from the Health and Sport Committee, these have been the questions that we've been asking ourselves from day one. And I hope the committee report has been useful to the government in trying to move forward questions around this, and specifically the unintended consequences of the bill. To answer these questions, I think we need to look no further than the RCN member survey on staffing. Last year, RCN Scotland carried out a survey of its members, and the survey have, uh, had 3,000 uh, responses um, from care and support workers across Scotland, delivering um, some very concerning responses. 51% said that the last shift was not staffed to the levels planned, and 53% said that the care was compromised as a result of that. 54% reported that they didn't have enough time to provide the level of care that they would have liked. 47% said they felt demoralised. 61% of respondents worked extra time, on average 46 minutes, at the end of their shift. Over a third said that because of a lack of time, they had to leave unnecessary care unprovided. Most impor importantly from the survey, though, was the statements from NHS staff and their world view of what the current workforce crisis is in Scotland. And I've picked out three points uh, made by NHS professionals. The only reason we had enough staff today is because we had bank staff. We had enough staff for the patients, but in mental health, we have attack respond situations. And no, for most of the night, we wouldn't have been able to assist staff if the colleague had been under threat of physical violence. When you're short staffed, the workload is the same. You have to get round everything. You're consistently chasing your tail. You're anxious, you're rushed, having the right staff changes that. Now, all of us in this chamber know and recognize that our NHS staff go the extra mile every day of the week to deliver the care that we value so much. But what tools can they have at their disposal when the environment and wards they work on reach unlevels, unsafe levels and the risk that that puts to their safety and the care of patients um, on that ward? And so I wanted to outline in the time I have uh, today some of the areas where I think the bill uh, does need to be improved. In relation to process, the Law Society of Scotland stated that stage one's guiding principles were too general. They fear that there could be a scope for subjective judgment leading to inevitable juggling of compromising and competing uh, priorities. Some stakeholders were concerned the bill could undermine care by focusing on process and narrowly defined settings rather than outcomes. And I think that's what we certainly heard at committee, that it was making sure our health service is outcome focused. In relation to accountability, the bill places a general duty to ensure appropriate staffing on health boards and care service providers. It states it will be health boards, commissioners and providers who will be accountable. And so one of the key concerns we heard and was raised with us uh, was the need for greater clarity on where accountability will sit within the bill. If no one is named as an accountable officer, there's a risk responsibility is felt at the level of people um, are running these tools, um, but who will become exposed uh, to adverse ev events arising and how that is fed higher up um, into the NHS management structures is something I think many members are still uh, not completely clear on, but um, it was professional judgment, uh, which I thought was also a key part of what the bill uh, should also see to improve and we'll be seeking to improve. Witnesses called for the input of professional judgment to be more prominent in the bill and I welcome um, some of what the cabinet secretary said. It was felt professionals had to be involved in the process with views taken at a local level, below executive and senior management level, as um, has been outlined by the committee's convener. While professional judgment is part of the new common staffing method, it's not including in the, included in the bill. The Royal College of Nursing believes it's essential that the bill enables the empowerment of nurses. I agree, and as the Cabinet Secretary has outlined, the opportunities which the bill can present, I hope we can really make sure we realise to empower our NHS staff and staff working in our health and social care settings. 
This bill is aimed at ensuring there are adequate, adequate staffing levels where health and social care is delivered. And as Alex Cole Hamilton stated, this bill could provide a much needed focus on workforce planning. With regard to the social care uh, setting, this is still, I think, a key area where the government and the committee would like to see more clarity on how the bill will Im impact and actually how these tools will be developed and delivered. I note ahead of uh, today's debate the concerns and reservations which were expressed by COSLER and SCVO and others with regard to the bill's proposals in a social care setting. Social care amounts to over a quarter of the third sector's turnover and 34% of voluntary organisations in Scotland are involved in delivering social care related activities. The provision in the bill relating to social care and the, the development and introduction of standardised workforce tools to the sector um, that has no, you know, the sector currently has no single governance structure and is made up of hundreds of diverse uh, organisations. This is clearly going to represent a major, major challenge and something I hope the Scottish Government clearly um, will bring forward more work on uh, and to build confidence um, and support in the sector. I welcome much of what the uh, Scottish Government and the Cabinet Secretary's uh, response to the committee outlined yesterday um, in her letter to the Health and Sport Committee. The unintended consequences of the bill have been outlined by many organisations ahead of stage one today, and I hope that as we see the bill progress, uh, we can look to address some of these. Um, to conclude, uh, Presiding Officer, Scottish Conservatives recognise that our health and social care workforce face a number of key challenges. With or without legislation, unless we urgently resolve the staff shortages across NHS Scotland, safe staffing levels will remain a dream rather than a reality. The Cabinet Secretary states in her response to the committee that the bill is about workforce, workload planning, not workforce planning. But for those who work in our NHS and social care services, these are of the same thing. And we need to see progress in addressing the staffing challenges in our health and social care services. As Karen Hedge, Scottish Care's National Director, told the committee, the bill will not magically create nurses. We need to be clear that working to deliver a full staffing complement must be the number one priority of the Scottish Government and of the Scottish Parliament. Scottish Conservatives support the general principles of the Health and Care Staffing Scotland Bill and will work cross-party to amend the bill as it progresses through Parliament. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now call on Monica Lennon to open for the Labour Party to be followed by Alison Johnson. Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to be opening for Scottish Labour in this debate. And I'd like to thank the Health and Sport Committee for its carefully considered report. And from listening to the convener, Lewis MacDonald, it is clear that the committee went to great lengths to gather evidence and to scrutinise the Health and Care Staff in Scotland Bill. And the committee's recommendations reflect that, that rich body of evidence. And I agree that the Scottish Government would do well to, to remain open to, to persuasion because there, there clearly is some room for improvement. Some of the committee's recommendations have been reinforced in the, the many stakeholder briefings that we've gratefully received ahead of this debate. This has been a, a milestone year for health. The, this year, the, or this summer, the, the Chamber and indeed the country came together to mark our NHS at 70 and we had a lot to celebrate. Our health service has saved and transformed countless lives. All of us in this Chamber will have a close personal affinity with the NHS. Moving forward, the integration of health and social care has the potential to be transformative. There are, however, underlying challenges that we must get to grip with in order to reduce the levels of ill health and health inequalities which persist. Under this government, we're not yet seeing enough progress on that front. The Cabinet Secretary said we are living longer, but we're not yet living healthier lives. And this matters because all of us have a right to health and want to live good, healthy lives. But it's also a matter of urgency because our health and social care services are struggling to cope. The Cabinet Secretary in her response to the committee stage one report says that the Scottish Government understands the pressure staff are facing. Now we know that the Cabinet Secretary has inherited this bill. I'm not convinced with all the pressures facing the NHS this is perhaps the bill she would have wanted but I know she's sticking with it and Scottish Labour will play her part to, to improve the bill and to strengthen it. And we are eager to work with the Cabinet Secretary and her team in, in the widest terms possible.
But as we debate the Health and Care Staffing Scotland Bill today, our focus has to remain on outcomes and what difference this legislation could make to the health and wellbeing of our constituents and our loved ones. Scotland's health and social care workforce is working tirelessly to provide the very best of care. It can't work any harder. It's far from easy. And Miles Briggs has talked already about nursing. And we know, according to the RCN, that there are times when staff are just not able to meet the needs of their patients due to staffing shortages, issues with the skill mix of teams and ever-increasing demand on services. And in the past few weeks, I've seen this firsthand uh, as my own mum has spent far too much time in hospital. So none of us are detached from that. It's, it's very real and, and it's happening now. And it must concern the Cabinet Secretary that Audit Scotland warns that the NHS in Scotland is not financially sustainable and its performance um, continues to decline. Today, we've had another Section 22 report on NHS Tayside and it's extremely serious. We have a health board that is facing perpetual financial crisis and the buck does stop with the Scottish Government. Currently, certainly. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you. I'm grateful to Ms Lennon to take an intervention. It's just in order to make sure that we have the absolutely correct context, I'm sure Ms Lennon will agree with me that the Section 22 order on uh, NHS Tayside re refers to the last financial year and that the Audit Scotland report by uh, the Auditor General's own acknowledgement did not, because it could not at that point, take account of the medium-term financial framework that I published. So in order to be sure that we're getting an accurate picture of the current state of play, perhaps we just need to add those extra bits of context in. Monica Lennon. Thank you. No, I'm glad the Cabinet Secretary put on the record her, her medium-term framework, but there is no denying that, again, we have a very serious report from the Auditor General, and I'm sure that the Audit Committee will pick that up and scrutinise that in, in due course. But currently in the NHS, there are enough job vacancies to fill two Scottish hospitals. The BMA say that the true number of consultant vacancies is double that of the official figures from ISD. Scottish Care point to a shocking 32% vacancy rate in, in nursing in social care and the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh say that unless staffing gaps are resolved, safe, safe staffing levels will remain a dream rather than a reality. So what will this bill do to address this staffing crisis? The Cabinet Secretary is clear that the bill is about workload planning, it's not about workforce planning. But put simply, there must be enough staff available to deal with the high workloads that NHS staff are experiencing. And again, there's, there's plenty of work that the Scottish Government has underway. And, and I look to the Public Health Minister and, and the work that he's um, focusing on right now in terms of alcohol and drugs. All of that's really important because to go back to my earlier remarks, this is about prevention and we've not seen enough preventative action to reduce the pressure on the NHS. So this bill is hopefully part of a, a wider, new, radical approach to health and social care workforce planning, which is person-centred. From Unison to the BMA, the message is really, really loud and clear that just putting existing duties into statute is not going to change anything uh, by itself. The Committee Stage 1 report highlights several areas of concern about the bill. The RCN highlight the importance of ongoing monitoring and the escalation of risks. Um, if, safe, if safe staffing levels fall below the requirement, there must be a quick, clear and effective route to escalation. These tools must work in real time so that if any health professional who finds himself on an understaffed ward can alert this problem. And we've had dozens of, of briefings, for example, the Royal College of Physicians and the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists highlight the importance of workforce planning supporting the new multidisciplinary models of care. Um, I'm getting to, to closure, uh, presiding officer. The bill aims to give parity between health and social care by also setting out staffing duties and care services. However, we've heard from COSLA, the Coalition of Care and Support Providers and the SCVO that they're all concerned that the bill is unsuitable for the care sector and could undermine integration. So we have to be alive to these concerns and I know my colleague Alex Riley will want to say more. In conclusion, um, Scottish Labour welcomes any efforts to improve safe staffing and we do support the general principles of this bill. But the bill isn't going to fix health and social care's workforce crisis 
by itself. NHS staff are facing burnout. Um, I was grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for taking my intervention on that point earlier. And I know she does take these matters very seriously. And in terms of social care, um, that sector needs to be overhauled because conditions are, are quite frankly not good enough for many social care staff. Scottish Labour believes that health and social care should be focused no, on... No, no, no. When you say in conclusion, <laughs> I think it means something to us, not... In conclusion, here comes another in chapter. In conclusion, we focus on the outcomes and we'll work with the government and others That's on absolutely. amendments to secure that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I know that trick. I've used it myself. Uh, I now call Alison Johnson, please, to open for the Greens, please. Thank you, presiding officer. The Greens support the general principles of the bill and will vote accordingly at decision time. However, it is clear that there have been sufficient concerns raised by many groups, including the Royal College of Nursing, Allied Health Professionals and COSLA, um, that we need to encourage the Scottish Government to continue to give these careful consideration. It's not surprising that there's a well-established link between safe staffing levels and the delivery of good quality care. A study by Professor Anne-Marie Rafferty found that both patients and nurses in hospitals with favourable patient-to-nurse ratios had consistently better outcomes than those in hospitals with less favourable staffing ratios. Patients in the hospitals with the highest patient-to-nurse ratios had 26% higher mortality, while the nurses in those hospitals were twice as likely to be dissatisfied with their jobs, to show high burnout levels, and to report low or deteriorating quality of care on their wards and hospitals. That being the case, it is concerning that Scotland continues to experience ongoing challenges in the recruitment of health and social care staff. Audit Scotland reports that vacancy rates for nursing and midwifery staff rose from 2.7% in 2013-14 to 4.5% in the last year. And currently, 30% of nursing, midwifery and allied health professional vacancies remain open for three months or more, an increase of a quarter on the previous year. And though there has been a national increase in nursing and midwifery staff over the past four years, numbers of staff in the year to March 2018 have fallen in some health board areas. Of nearly 20,000 nursing and midwifery staff responding to the 2017 I Matter staff experience survey, barely a quarter said that there were enough staff to allow them to do their jobs properly, with less than half saying that they were able to meet all the conflicting demands on their time. Now, the provisions of the bill may well play a role in ensuring our health and social care staff services are appropriately staffed. And Greens welcome the guiding principles for health and care staffing, respecting the dignity and rights of care service users, ensuring the well-being of staff, and being open with staff and service users about decisions relating to staffing are all welcome principles. The duty of health boards to ensure staffing is appropriate for the health, well-being and safety of patients. You know, that is welcome, but I would welcome the, the Cabinet Secretary in closing perhaps um, to elaborate further on the government's intention to further extend this duty to cover the well-being of, uh, and safety of staff. Because below adequate levels of staffing have an impact on the well-being of staff as well as the patients. I know we are all agreed on that matter. The survey of staff presented in the Nursing Against the Odds report paints a concerning picture of the physical and mental toll on nursing staff when staff levels are below what is needed. An A&E nurse surveyed said that because of low staffing levels and lack of resources, they felt exhausted, stressed and dehydrated. And this is consistent with the 51% of Scots nursing and midwifery staff surveyed who reported feeling exhausted and <coughs> negative. I'd also ask the Cabinet Secretary to consider whether the terms health, well-being and safety could be more explicitly defined. And I'd draw attention to the stage one submission from NHS Orkney, which said, the perception of what is safe and what has been agreed may differ. And we need to ensure that this in turn doesn't become an area of tension between staff and managers. The duty on health boards to report on how they've ensured proper staffing, followed the common staffing method, and how they've trained and consulted staff is welcome. However, could this be made more specific with boards having additional requirements to report where the duty hasn't been met? While individual board reports would be welcome, 
Accountability might be improved if there was a responsibility on the Scottish Government to collate a report covering all boards and to lay this before Parliament. This would allow for transparency, consistency of reporting and therefore better public scrutiny. Now, the Royal College of Nursing, with others, is seeking a wide range of amendments to the Bill and I look forward to working with them all as we move to stage two. I'd encourage the Scottish Government to continue to engage with these bodies on the issues they raise. Um, in particular, I'd like to focus just now on enabling senior nurses to discharge their management duties fully by being non-caseload holding and to add provision allowing nursing staff to undertake continuous professional development. And on the inclusion of the care sector, this is a crucial issue on which there is clearly not yet a clear consensus. And I note in particular the very strongly worded statement released by COSLA which says that the Scottish Government has yet to demonstrate the bill will improve outcomes for people in receipt of care and for social care staff. It's important that we note that the provisions of the bill will only play a small role in ensuring that there are appropriate levels of staffing. And many of the briefings we've received have raised issues relating to the scope of the bill. If it does nothing to address supply and availability of trained staff, then boards and social care providers alike will find it difficult to meet the duties which would be placed upon them. The Royal College of Nursing has questioned whether the legislation can be, and I am quoting, implemented fully and in a way which will improve the quality of care that patients received without significant investment, particularly in the workforce, and without recognition of the reality of current workforce pressure and with likely future increased demand on services. Um, in closing, presiding officer, I would ask the Cabinet Secretary to outline what investment is being made in the health and social care workforce and how the bill sits within a broader strategy to address the supply of staff. I would ask her to consider the RCN suggestion that there should be a duty on the government to ensure that there is a supply of nursing staff which is sufficient to meet current and future demand. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call Alec Cole Hamilton from the Liberal Democrats. Mr Cole Hamilton, please. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. It's my uh, privilege to offer the support of the Liberal Democrats for the general principles of the Health and Care Staffing Bill. And treading as I do in the footsteps of my friend and colleague, Kirsty Williams, who, um, as a Liberal Democrat Assembly member, stewarded a very similar piece of legislation through the Welsh Assembly some years ago. Um, it's important, I think, when we, whenever we talk about staffing, to reflect our, how much we rely on our NHS staff, and not just our NHS staff, but those working out in social care in the community and our allied health professionals, particularly at this time of year, they deserve the thanks of a grateful parliament and a grateful nation. It's important and incumbent on any committee charged with the consideration of a piece of legislation to ask the first question at the top of that consideration, is this needed? And I was really struck by a conversation I had with Sarah Atherton, who works for the Royal College of Nursing, when I asked her exactly that question. She relayed to me a conversation that she had had with a senior nurse in a psychiatric ward when she'd asked, were you safely staffed last night? She said, well, there's two answers to that question. Yes, we had enough staff to treat our patients, but because we have to operate on an attack response basis, we were not safely staffed because we did not have enough staff should something have gone down, should some crisis have happened. And for me, that uh, epitomizes why this bill is needed because for years um, we have ignored the anxieties and expertise of staff on the ground. Oftentimes, and I think this is a fair criticism of all parties who have held government in this country, that financial targets have often held priority over safety. And there are many examples that we all probably know which mirror the example of that psychiatric ward. And this bill not, in this uh, bill, we are offered the opportunity not only just to fix the numbers, to, but to ensure, I hope, that we get the right balance of skills and experience in every staff team, in every care setting. Because with the right skills mix and the right number of staff, we have an empirical link to safer outcomes. And so we need more on the face of the bill, I believe, to link method methodologies, tools, and practice to outcomes and draw that golden thread right through. 
And that's, uh, that's why I'm very grateful to hear the Cabinet Secretary's remarks this afternoon about strengthening the professional voice within the bill, is to listen and to act on the suggestions of those at the chalk face. Because innovation, as I said in my intervention, comes from the grassroots most of the time, and best practice is germinated in those wards. So we need the staff voice, but we also need clear accountability as well. And I think that's something that we've always regarded as a slight gap in the bill. And that accountability needs to be held at several levels because when it's everybody's job to make some, sure something happens, it suddenly becomes nobody's job to make sure something happens. And I absolutely endorse uh, what Alison Johnson said earlier about the idea that senior charge nurses should be non-case holding, should have that strategic overview. And and as such, um, as a clinical leader, not counted in the headcount uh, of a sta safe staffing cohort. Every set care setting, whether that's in uh, acute or non-acute or in the community, should be encouraged to catalogue and display their staffing levels so that they can benchmark success and aspire to greater things. But having that somebody unencumbered by operational issues is absolutely vital for ensuring that accountability. So we need to trust the expertise of our staff. We are blessed by some incredibly gifted staff. And it is the recognition of that correlation between staff well-being and patient safety, which is vital. And, and I, I fear there is still scant detail as to how that's achieved in the bill, ensuring that staffing cohorts within any care setting are supported themselves, both psychologically, in terms of stress, and in terms of stress management. And I think there is a direct causal link here to what we're doing in the ongoing discussion that this, this chamber and the committees of this parliament are having about whistleblowing to ensure that our staff are supported and are, are supported to raise concerns as well. When we talk about staff, we're not just talking about nurses. And I think that there was a, initially a slightly myopic view that this bill was just about nursing um, and uh, for, for all their strengths and the fact that they have driven this agenda. And I thank them for it. But they recognise that this has to encompass social care staff and indeed uh, allied health professionals as well, because each of those professions provides a, a vital and important part to every patient's care pathway. And particularly, we talk about um, delayed discharge in this hospital and the lack of social care provision. That care pathway can cause an interruption in flow throughout the entirety of the health service. So it's important that those uh, professions, which don't necessarily have the methodologies as established as the nursing, nursing profession, are afforded the space by this bill to grow those methods methodologies in their own toolkits to interconnect with the methodologies of their uh, multidisciplinary colleagues. Um, finally, I'll, I'll close in, in, in this way, presiding officer. As with child poverty, and I, I said this to the, the Cabinet Secretary as well, as with the child poverty bill, you can't just legislate and make something happen. You can legislate for aspiration, but you have to back that up by culture change and empirical policy change on the ground as well. We have to recognise that this bill won't end nursing shortages or the social care staffing crisis in our communities. They won't be solved by this bill, but it's an absolutely vital part of the jigsaw for ensuring that it is a sustainable, safe and attractive profession for people to come into. It is part of that drive to increase provision within those sectors. Nor should attempts to deliver in one sector safe staffing come at the expense of another. And that was my other intervention, ensuring that we're not just in, uh, having a gold-plated service and a gold-plated safe staffing culture in acute sectors at the expense of community settings and non-acute settings as well equally vital in patient pathways. So this bill is needed uh, and it will enjoy the support of the Liberal Democrats tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, open debate, speeches of six minutes as usual, but there is some little time in hand for interventions, which I would encourage. Uh, call Emma Harper to be followed by Annie Wales. Ms Harper, please. Thank you, President Officer. Today we're here in Chamber to debate and hopefully agree on the general principles of the health and care staffing bill presented by the government and as deputy convener of the health and sport committee i'd like to start by saying that i agree with the general principles laid out in the bill and i support the government's motion today i was a new msp for the south scotland region when the first minister announced the scottish government's intention to enshrine safe staffing into law at the royal college of nursing congress in glasgow in june 2016 
I was a new MSP, had just been providing direct patient care as a clinical nurse educator for NHS Dumfries and Galloway just a month before the First Minister's announcement. I enjoyed my work as a nurse educator and as a perioperative nurse and my 30 years of clinical experience in America, England and Scotland has helped inform me in the scrutiny of the proposed bill at stage one. And along with colleagues, I'd like to acknowledge the amazing work that all health professionals who provide care across health and social care 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The people who are the professionals are truly amazing. Presiding officer, the committee has taken evidence from a range of stakeholders since the bill was introduced in May this year. And stakeholders such as the Royal College of Nursing and Allied Health Professionals, the BMA and COSLA and others, and I thank them for their input. There are, of course, issues in the bill that need to be addressed, and I would like to bring the attention to the following. I'd like to highlight that the purpose of the bill is to set out the principles for ensuring that there will be appropriate staffing to deliver high quality care to patients, clients and service users across a complex care system. The intention is to enable an evidence-based approach to provide safe, efficient and person-centred care. It is important to be clear that the bill does not focus on national workforce planning, but the bill includes a focus on the development and application of workforce planning tools. Some of these tools have not been developed yet. This was something raised in evidence from the allied health professionals who appeared at committee. One of my former colleagues in the NHS of recent Galloway was very clear with me that this bill must include the whole multidisciplinary team. As the integration of health and social care progresses, we really do need to make sure that all specialties who are providing care, whether in primary care, acute care, care in home environments or in the community, are included in this legislation as it progresses. Presiding officer, I'm interested in the development of the workforce plan and tools. We've heard that current common staffing methodology uses a triangulation approach and includes workforce tools of professional judgment, as well as specific tools aimed at areas such as operating room or neonatal intensive care units, for example. There is a difference in delivering care in rural southwest Scotland at Galloway Community Hospital compared to Glasgow and Edinburgh, the city centres where trauma services and different specialty acute care delivery is essential. I was interested to hear in the evidence that the development of new tools may take up to 10 years. But I note that in the financial memorandum, this, the, there's two further tools are in development and more will be developed within five years. But I'd like to ask the Scottish Government what work is being done currently to perhaps speed up the process of development of appropriate tools, especially with allied health professionals across multidisciplinary teams. What work has been done to actually develop the tools in a perhaps more timely way? And I know that it can take a long time to implement change in the National Health Service, as being a nurse with a whole family of nurses uh, can attest to as well. And the fact that we are currently pursuing an integrated health and social care system will really take on board the fact that many different types of professionals support health and social care needs across Scotland. Presiding officer, I welcome the briefing submitted from the Royal College of Nursing, the Association of Anaesthetists and the Royal College of Physicians, as well as others. Yesterday, when I spoke with the senior RCN representative, I discussed the RCN's proposal to allow for senior charge nurses not to have their own caseload, therefore allowing them to focus on supporting the coordination of care, support and management of staff and other time-consuming duties that they are responsible for. And I welcome Alison Johnston's comments because she's saying the similar thing about supporting the, the work of the senior charge nurses to not have their own caseload. That actually applies across many of the healthcare situations that we work in. I support this in principle and uh, recognise that uh, there will inevitably be instances where senior charge nurses will provide direct patient care, such as in the operating theatre. However, the principle of charge nurses having no direct caseload is one that I support and would like to see the Scottish Government explore options of this as we move forward with the bill. Presiding officer, I've been in the operating room where everything is going smoothly until the aorta was punctured during a straightforward minimal invasive surgery procedure. 
This is when the professional judgment and immediate ability to react to the fast changing life saving situation is paramount. Flexibility must be built into the legislation. Flexibility to allow immediate staff and judgments to be made. So I know this bill takes into account the professional judgment tool that has been described in both written and face-to-face -face evidence from experts at the committee, which I welcome. I welcome the bill and I'd like to put my thanks on record for all those who attended sessions at the committee and indeed all who have been involved in the process. And I'd like to thank the Scottish Government and take to take a look at some of the issues highlighted, including the senior charge nurses and their workload, and I look forward to participating in the progress of the bill. Thank you. Thank you. I call Annie Wells to be followed by Keith Brown. Ms. Wells, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The importance of NHS staff goes without saying, and at some point in most of our lives, we will have had our lives changed for the better, thanks to the personal dedication of those providing the high quality care. We understand the immense pressure on staff who work under extremely difficult conditions, sometimes at a detriment to their own health, making this bill all the more important. While the Scottish Conservatives support the bill in principle, we have concerns shared by a number of organisations. And at stage two, as my colleague Miles Briggs has said, we will look to strengthen the bill through amendments focusing on giving professionals a strong voice and making sure that decision-making data is robust and up-to-date. One aspect of the bill that I want to focus on is its valuing of the importance of staff wellbeing. It's clear that staff are being pushed to their limits and that staffing shortages are taking their toll. And as we've heard from Monica Lennon as well today, in the last three years, the number of NHS staff absences due to staff suffering stress has increased by nearly 18%, resulting in more than 1 million working days being lost. And in Glasgow, the increase in absences is even higher, at nearly 25%. What's clear is that staff are struggling to cope. And I'm pleased to see the importance of staff wellbeing being a guiding principle. And I really hope this bill can in some way provide the basis to which we can improve the current situation. However, it is worth mentioning that the majority of witnesses did raise their concerns that the bill is being introduced at a time when workforce is under pressure from a general recruitment and retention problem. Statistics currently showing, for example, that hospitals are short of 2,400 nurses and midwives and that NHS wards are in need of 950, uh, 750 more doctors. Yes, absolutely. Keith Brown. Can I thank Annie Wells for taking the intervention and uh, I'm sure she'll have read the report from the committee and she'll realise the concern amongst the witnesses about the effect of Brexit both currently and in prospect and how much a role that plays in the recruitment issues that they are currently facing. Does she agree? Annie Wells. Can I thank Keith Brown for the intervention? What I would say is that this has not just happened overnight, this is something that the concerns have been raised for quite a while. So we have to look at it in the longer term as well, because it's not just, we don't just need 750 doctors in the last two years. Um, the Royal College of Nurses, in response to the bill, stated that it was important not to tie the hands of boards and put a duty on them to provide appropriate staffing if the supply issue, which is held by the Scottish Government, is not dealt with. In the third sector of the voluntary, the Scottish Council for Voluntary Organisations has expressed concern that given 34% of voluntary organisations in Scotland are involved in social care related activities, additional duties placed upon organisations cannot be considered in isolation of the resource provided. Linked to this, greater clarity must be given on where accountability lies, a concern noted by the Chartered Society of Physio Physiotherapy. A general duty has been placed on health boards and care service providers to ensure appropriate staffing, but if no one is named as an accountable officer, senior charge nurses and team leaders will be left exposed should an adverse event arise at, as a result of shortages in staffing. This was supported by those in the care sector. Unison Scotland highlighted the precarious situation of accountability given the fragmentation of delivery of care services and who will be responsible for safe staffing levels and reporting on them within the third sector? This will be especially difficult to answer when care provision is commissioned from a third party. Whilst we support the principles of this bill, 
The Scottish Conservatives believe it's vital that professional judgment plays an important role. And I'm pleased to hear the Cabinet Secretary address those points earlier. And as the, as the committee, the, the Health and Sport Committee, his comments have been made, it's believed that professionals had to be involved in the process with views taken at local level to take account of the day-to-day -day dynamic staffing of health settings. And existing tools must be made to accommodate absence levels, differing staff skill mixes and the needs of patients. As stated by the Royal College of Nurses, without nurses of appropriate seniority exercising professional judgment each day, safe staffing, safe staffing levels will not be reached. And the SCVO has stated, given its importance in delivering social care, that it too must be consulted on legislative proposals. As well as the need for staffing models that allow decisions to be made on the ground, we also want to make sure decisions are made based on the most accurate of data. And amongst the moving feast of real-time decision-making in wards and across community teams, healthcare professionals need to be confident that they trust the reliable and up-to-date data. It's only through this that strategic decisions can be made to enable safe, high-quality care and services. To finish today, presiding officer, I would like again to express my support for the principles of th this bill. Ultimately, this is a bill that puts an, ex an existing but enhanced workforce planning method on a statutory footing with principles that are unobjectionable. We all want to see the highest quality of care given to patients consistently across health boards with the well-being of staff always in mind. At stage two, the Scottish Conservatives will work cross-party to submit amendments that seek to strengthen the bill, and I hope some of the comments made today will be taken on board. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Keith Brown to be followed by Alec Rowley. Mr Brown, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, just to uh, mention again the uh, aim of the bill, which is to be an enabler of high-quality care and improved outcomes for service users in both the health service and care services by helping to ensure appropriate staffing for high-quality care. I think it's important to do that because we started off with a very, I think, balanced and fair account of the committee's work from the convener, Lewis MacDonald, but the debate has gone to a number of other areas related and quite legitimately, but I think it's important to bear in mind what the purpose of the bill is. And for me, it's really the latest development in the efforts that we've made to try and drive the high standards in our health care, and by we, I mean everybody uh, in the health and social care sectors, and also to make best practice a standard which is to be achieved across the board. So as the policy memorandum states, the aim of the bill is to provide a statutory basis for the provision of appropriate staffing in health and care service settings, thereby enabling safe and high quality care and improved outcomes for service users. The provision of high quality care, of course, requires the right people in the right place with the right skills at the right time to ensure the best health and care outcomes for service users and people experiencing care. And from my point of view, we've heard general support for the general principles of the bill what I found a little bit odd was some of the witnesses that came before the committee, when asked if they supported this, said they didn't support it and they didn't see any way in which it can be improved. Uh, I think in particular the thing that concerned me was the idea, especially those who quite rightly focused on the needs of the care sector, to my mind this presents an opportunity to ensure that we have the right staffing, so it strengthens the arguments of those that want to see improved staffing in the care sector. And I'm not sure uh, on what basis people would not want to support that, by all means seek to improve it, but at least support the aim. An aim does mean that at a strategic level, the planning of staffing within both our NHS and the associated social care and care home provision is taken in such a way as to maximise the effectiveness of the resources which are available and to deliver for our clients and also to make sure their experience of health and, health and care must always be our paramount consideration. We have to ensure that the systems we put in place in this regard should help ensure that the practices within health and care in Scotland are the best they can be, and in doing so, that the patient experience is a positive one. In relation to the issues around recruitment, it was quite evident that there are currently and have been building for some time pressures because of Brexit. I think probably, and I couldn't evidence this from what we heard, but I think probably more acutely in the care sector uh, than the health sector, but in both sectors. And that those pressures are building day on day, week on week, month on month. A very substantial issue in terms of recruitment. It's mentioned, for example, I think at para 206 on page 34, when it says, Brexit uncertainties mean that it's challenging to meet the existing requirements and staffing establishments currently set by health boards and social care providers. 
Uh, so, in specific terms, the bill itself is intended to deliver a number of things. Uh, the promotion of safety in the health and care sector is at the heart of the bill, and that also means safety both for clients and for the health and care staff themselves. And the mechanism for delivering this is by creating a statutory duty on staffing levels and applying these to territorial and special health boards. Uh, such a mechanism would require appropriate staff planning and risk management to be undertaken. And during the recent round of consultation on the bill, the committee asked stakeholders for views on this and how the bill could best achieve this. In their submission, my own local health board, NHS Fort Valley, stated the positive outcomes for patients and staff must be at the heart of the decision-making process. The workforce tools will run consistently with health and social care boards having to act upon the results. The NHS Fourth Valley also proposed the need for a formal reporting structure to be part of any process, and they were among a number of consultees who stressed the need to clearly identify who is responsible for undertaking this. Now, I've got some sympathy with that. The one thing I would say is in relation to outcomes and talk of sanctions and targets, many of us stand up in this chamber and talk about the problem with bureaucracy in the health board, and there's a real danger that we can create new forms of bureaucracy here. So I think it's very important that as we go through the different stages of the bill, we bear that fact in mind. Club Manager and Stirling Health and Social Care Partnership also commented on the general principles of the bill, stating that it welcomed the guiding principle of a rigorous, transparent approach to decision-making about staffing in health and social care. And that's what we should be aiming for. And if at the end of that process people can point to deficiencies or ways it can be approved, then the bill is achieving its purpose. For example, the uh, Club Manager uh, Stirling Health and Social Care Partnership also said there are concerns regarding additional expectations on planning and commission departments, but that should be a good thing. If there are additional expectations on the Commission departments, that should help address some of the perceived uh, issues in relation to staffing uh, in those sectors. Uh, there are entirely fair concerns to raise at this stage of the consideration of the bill, but I welcome the general acceptance from the many consultation responses submitted that the principle and the direction of travel of this bill is the right one. And in our detailed consideration, consideration of this going forward, we have to take cognizance of those views. I also think the points raised in the briefing sent to MSPs by the Royal College of Nursing were valuable, and given the central part RCN's members will play in dealing with this uh, uh, when legislation is enacted, I think it's certainly worth considering the points they raised uh, for a moment. They raised six tests, and just before Labour MSPs get too excited, it was nothing to do with Brexit. Uh, they were looking for positive outcomes, uh, putting staff at the heart of decision-making, which I, I think the bill seeks to do. It tries to get the professional judgment. Somebody called it subjective judgment. We're looking for the professionals to make a judgment on this. That's a vital part of this. And I believe the Cabinet Secret uh, Secretary gave assurances both today and at the committee when she appeared before that suggests that will happen. It's really important that it does. So I welcome the general principles of the bill. I welcome also some of the points made by a, a number of members. It, it strikes me there's a, a good basis on which to go forward in relation to this bill, not least because the Cabinet Secretary has given her assurance, first of all, in her response, uh, and by saying that she intends to listen to what's been said as we move through that process. And I think with that kind of cooperation and constructive engagement, we can get the right bill at the end. So I'm happy to support the bill. Thank you very much, Mr Brown. I call Alec Rowley to be followed by Sandra White. Mr Rowley, please. Thank you, President Officer. I would uh, want to begin by congratulating and thanking uh, Lewis MacDonald and the Health and Sports Committee for producing this detailed report, which I think will be very useful moving forward to stage two. I know that, that Jean Freeman, the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport, issued a, a response to that last evening. I've not had a chance to, to read that properly, but again, uh, I think it will be useful moving forward. I take the point that, that, that Keith Brown makes about focusing on the purpose of the bill, and he says that it's about appropriate staffing and safe staffing, but it's a bit like the Emperor's clothes. If, if you don't have the staff, then appropriate and safe staffing uh, will, be, will be difficult to, to achieve. And it reminds me a bit of legislation where you legislate, and I question you know, the legislation in the terms of you legislate to give people a treatment guarantee. And you then, of course, recognise, and we know that having a treatment guarantee does not guarantee people treatment when they actually need that treatment. And therefore, the very question of what legislation purpose is for is something I think that, that legitimately we need to ask in terms of this bill and perhaps some other bills that are making their way through Parliament at this present time. I do know that the, the Royal uh, College of Physicians raised a few issues and they say legislation alone will not fill the rota gaps and vacancies in the workforce. 
the recognition in paragraph 97 of the policy memorandum that there is currently significant challenges in recruitment in both health and care service settings needs to be addressed. And I think, I think we, we really do. Yeah, absolutely. Cabinet Secretary. I'm grateful to Mr Rowley for taking the intervention and I, I'm sure he will acknowledge that I have never at any point said that this bill will automatically by itself produce the numbers of professionals across health and social care that we need, but that what it is, is an important additional tool to help us uh, workforce plan as well as we can. Getting the information via the application of this legislation to ensure that we have evidence, robust evidence, in order to identify how exactly we should continue to increase the numbers we have in training and in nursing and medicine and in our allied health professionals. So it is one of the tools we have. It's not the automatic silver bullet to fix the problem. Alec Rowley. And I think Monica Lennon acknowledged that when she opened for Labour and said that we, in principle, support this bill, but we need to do quite a lot of work on it. And there are some serious questions that have been raised by the third sector, by COSLA and others that need to be addressed going into stage two. But nevertheless, I'm sure as parliamentarians, we all know that our constituents out there are asking the question, what are we actually doing about the staff shortages that does ensure that people don't are not guaranteed the health care they need when when they need that health care uh, if you look for example in Fife at the current time there's seven practices in Fife that are, are registering as, as as being in difficulty high risk situation uh, NHS Fife say they can't recruit the GPs there are practices where they're having to close their lists. There are currently 16 practices that are full. Now, that's not just about accessing GP services, as the Cabinet Secretary knows. That's about accessing a whole range of community health services that would be part of a holistic health service. Those, those services are struggling right now. And my constituents are saying to me, what are you doing about that? And I ask myself, where does this legislation actually provide that support? And I think we need to be honest with the public and we need to start addressing the big issues that are in health at the present time. COSLA make a point in terms of social care. COSLA, COSLA by the way, have produced a two-page briefing that is highly, highly critical of this current legislation. And I think we need to address that uh, moving forward. But they say the bill is poorly timed as the social care workforce is experiencing challenges in terms of recruitment and retention. I would say that, that we need to look at social care. I think Monica Lennon spoke earlier about 70 years off the NHS. The NHS in 2020 is going to be looking a lot different from what, when it was established back in the, the late 40s. Um, I don't think we've actually asked the question and looked at what does a modern day national health service in Scotland look like? And part of that is, of course, social care. And that's why we wouldn't necessarily uh, sign up to what COSLA has to say here about social care being separate. But the fact is that currently social care is provided through local authorities and health boards. It's provided through the third sector, and that's why we have so many third sector organisations coming in here with concerns, but it's also provided through the private sector. And one of the major problems in recruiting for that social sector is lack of job security, poor pay, poor terms and conditions. So what would a National Health Service look like in 2020? A National Health Service is not built just round about hospital buildings. A National Health Service is, paying, is caring for people in their own homes. But why should that workforce be on the minimum wage or 
or the, 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 the living wage when other parts of that workforce are paid a more decent pay and have decent terms and conditions and have job security. So what does the workforce of the National Health Service look like moving into 2020? And should all those social carers be part of the health service? Or are we going to allow the modern health service to be split into a private sector provision that pays lower wages, terms and conditions? So we need to invest in our workforce and we need to ask some fundamental questions about what that workforce looks like moving forward. So I say to the Cabinet Secretary, Labour will work with you on this, but we think we need to be more, more bolder, more radical and looking at what a modern health service in Scotland looks like. Thank you very much, Mr Rowley. I call Sandra White to follow by Edward Mountain. Ms White, please. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And can I take this opportunity to thank um, my fellow members on the committee uh, and the witnesses and, of course, the clerks uh, for their guidance, certainly to me anyway and others, and the hard work that they've put in to get to this stage one of this report. Uh, presiding officer, th this bill's remit is intended to cover staff planning in health and social care services with the aim that staffing in both sectors is organised and planned to ensure appropriate staff are in place uh, by providers to enable them to deliver safe and high quality care and also, of course, the safety of staff, which is paramount also. Now, Alex Cole Hamilton uh, made an important point. He's not in the moment. I think he made an important point, and also uh, Emma Harper made this point as well, I think, in regards to, yes, at the very beginning, the RCN was seen to be the driver of this particular bill. But it was quickly recognised that uh, this bill is not just about acute services. Uh, it's quickly recognised that it's about all health and care providers, and they all had a part to play, and in particular to further the health and social care integration, which I think is really, really important. And I thank the members for raising that as well, and the RCN for recognising that it didn't just cover acute care. And in my contribution, I do want to concentrate on the integration of health and social care. I do note the concerns of COSLA, and I picked up what uh, Alec Rowley had already said, but I think when you, you look at some of the issues they raised, one of the issues they said is the bill is a potential threat to the integration of health and social care. I think it's rather sad that they've actually used that as a headline, and I'm sure in the Health Committee we'll look to that, and I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary and the Minister will be looking at that also, because I think uh, the integration of health and social care is, is paramount to get health care that we want, which everyone else has spoken about. And as I said, it's not to me just about acute care, and I don't think it is that to anyone else either. I don't think we should be focusing on acute care alone. I do think we need to look at the in integration and the other members, are, and I think it was Alex Cole Hamilton, again, I think the cab sec mentioned this as well, in regard to a cultural change. I think we need to see a cultural change, and that was certainly raised by witnesses uh, to the committee as well. And I think uh, if there's even debating uh, this bill at this stage, that could be a starting point for people to listen to, actually, that there should be a cultural change within uh, you know, the various providers as well. Now, I want to turn to uh, the evidence that we received, and, and uh, I do thank the Cabinet Secretary and the Scottish Government for the replies that they gave to us. And the first one was uh, 194, and that's staffing and care services. And we have made the recommendation. We did say we can see the attractions and advantages from treating all parts of delivery of health and care in the same manner. And we can see no rationale to ultimately treat this sector any differently from the NHS. Both are providing services to the public and the public should be assured that they and their relatives are being looked after adequately with care, professionalism and dignity. And I do uh, thank the Cabinet Secretary and the Scottish Government uh, for replying to, to that. And uh, in the reply, the Scottish Government's response is, is our intention that the development of any new tool and methodology would be carried out in a similar manner in the way in which the existing tools were developed in health. A clinical reference group is established prior to the development of any new tool and all health boards are invited to contribute to the clinical reference group. So I hope that allays some of the fears which COSLA has raised in uh, any other allied health professionals in that regard. Because I really do think that uh, integration uh, is one of the great things we can move forward with this bill. I know it's a, a work in progress, but I think 
it should be one of the areas that we should absolutely be covering. And perhaps uh, I'm a little selfish in, in mentioning that. Uh, I'm the convener of a uh, cross-party group in older people, age and ageing, and we've had lots of interest from our members and discussions and organisations as well regarding the integration of health and social care, particularly in the pr provision of community care and care homes and the staffing of these. In fact, uh, this cross-party group will be hearing from Brian Slater, Head of Partnership Support within the Health and Social Care Integration Directorate of the Scottish Government next week at our cross-party group. And I'm sure the members will be interested to listen to and hear what we've had to say in this debate and also what Mr Slater has to say about the progress which is being made uh, with the integration. And I know cross-party group members will be looking to find out what the implications are, perhaps, of the staffing bill, the stage one bill we have at the moment, and what the levels will be, particularly as we're dealing with an increasing ageing population and the pressure that they have on the system. So I think it's important that we do look at that particular one. As I said previously, in my summing up, uh, presiding officer, I do understand that this bill is at stage one. It's very much a work in progress, and I do look forward to, to being here and seeing as it progresses through Parliament, and hopefully we can come to uh, stage three of the bill. We'll all agree with it, and even Cosla and others will actually say, well, integration really is something that's very important. And this staffing bill is not just about acute services, it's about all of the care provision in health and social care as well. Thank you very much, President Officer. Thank you. I call Edward Mountain to be followed by David Torrance. Mr Mountain, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I'd like to join with my colleagues uh, here in supporting, in principle, the health care bill. And I'd like to also st start at the outset by thanking the committee for their in-depth report. I know how much work goes into them. Uh, I'd also like to reiterate a word of caution that's already been raised this afternoon for, for the government, and that's to quote the Royal College of Physicians in Edinburgh, you cannot legislate staff into existence. Now, making new laws can identify work frameworks and targets for staffing, but frankly, we need actions on recruiting to make the bill meaningful. Let's look at another bill, if, if we could, in relation to this. The Patient Rights Act sets down a 12-week tra treatment guarantee into law. This is workload planning, or should have been when it was established. But the problem is, it's a law that many of my constituents in the Highland is broken on a weekly basis, if not a daily basis. I mean, I, I mentioned in passing that we found out that two constituents uh, this week have waited 72 weeks. That's 72 weeks for chronic pain treatment in NHS Ireland. And frankly, that's not acceptable. So I think the Scottish Government accept that legislation alone will not reduce waiting times, and legislation alone will not recruit the re uh, resolve the recruitment crisis affecting our NHS. And won't, this bill in itself won't ensure the greater delivery of service. However, I think the health and care bill can make a difference, but only if it's used as part of a wider range of measures to tackle workforce planning across our NHS. And if this bill does make the difference that it needs to do, I think it needs to be strengthened significantly. And we've already heard from my colleague, Miles Briggs, that the Scottish Conservative will be lodging amendments to ensure that professionals are given a strong voice in the staffing process based on workloads and to ensure that the decision-making process data is robust and up-to-date. I think that's critical. And why do these amendments matter? Well, we believe on this, the, on this side of, of the chamber that hard-working doctors and nurses know perhaps better than anyone what, what it comes to make safe staffing levels to deliver the service that's required. But I believe their voices have often been ignored when they've raised this in, in the past. And let, let me give you an example, if I may, of where this workforce, pl workforce planning is failing. In August 2017, over 50 doctors and consultants signed a letter to the Board of NHS stating the crisis in radiology staffing is so acute in the Highland, it's reached an unprecedented level. You'd think that'd be a clear warning on workforce planning and delivery. I, can I just finish this point and then I'll come back to you, Mr. Brown. A year on, I would just say that the situation is far worse and NHS has been with no substantial interventional radiologists in post. That means patients are needing to travel to NHS Tayside and Grampian. And I think that's frankly unacceptable. And I think that is a failure of workload planning 
which has come about because of poor workforce planning. Now, Mr Brown. Uh, Keith Brown. Can I thank Edward Mountain for taking intervention and say he commended the work of the committee and the witnesses to it. And one of uh, the issues raised by the witnesses was this issue of Brexit, particularly, if I recall right, in relation to radiographers. Does he concede the point that Brexit, especially in rural areas of Scotland, is having a detrimental effect on recruitment in the NHS? Edward Mountain. Well, you know, it's all very easy to find something that, that, that's going on at the moment to blame for the problem. But for me, the problem goes back for a lot longer than that. It goes back to poor workforce planning probably up to 10 years ago. And, and, you know, if the First Minister was here in the chamber, I'd ask her about that as well. Now, I don't believe that there has been enough planning, uh, not only by the government, but also by, in the case of my constituency and region, is the NHS Highland to resolve uh, the, the problem. And speaking privately to healthcare professionals, which I do almost on a weekly basis, they have come to the same conclusion as me. Now, hopefully, what this bill will need to address is how to make safe staffing levels possible to deliver the services that are required. And it's a question of which do you put first. I believe doctors and nurses know what re are required to re produce the service that they're required. And I believe that the problem is that they are often constrained by those in administration who believe that they know better. Now, what we also know, that staffing levels... When staffing levels are low, pressure on existing staff increases. This leads to unrealistic expectations that with, with reduced numbers, the same service... Sorry, this leads to the unexpected, unrealistic expectation that with reduced numbers, the same service can be delivered. It can't. This often leads to unrealistic demands which become overbearing and unachievable, causing staff to feel bullied and undervalued. The result is they leave. And it's also become clear that this leads to problem with recruiting. Let me give you an example. The orthopedic department in, or orthodontic department in NHS Highland hasn't functioned for two years. The OMF, OMFS department hasn't functioned for three years. Definitely needed, identified as a problem, but there's no one there to man it. This, to me, creates a perfect storm, and I'm worried that this bill won't address the, this in its current form. That's why it needs amendments and strong input from those on the ground, not just those in offices. I also believe that the bill needs a provision in it that protects the welfare of our staff. Not to do so, to me, would be a failure. I'll be looking, hopefully, with members across this chamber, but certainly with my colleague, Miles Briggs, and colleagues on these benches to find a suitable amendment that takes this into account. Presiding officer, in conclusion, I support the bill knowing it doesn't go far enough at this stage, but with amendments, it can perhaps do that. It is at the moment, to me, not sufficiently aspirational or inspirational, but I believe there's a really good opportunity with proper amendments, which should come from across this chamber, to make it both of those. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call David Torrance to be followed by Anas Sarwar. Mr Torrance, please. Thank you, President Officer. I would also like to say thank you to everyone that has contributed to the process, particularly the committee clerks for all their hard work, healthcare professions and the representatives that gave up their valuable time to participate in our evidence sessions. NHS Scotland's workforce is growing and the demands upon our health and social care sector has never been greater. We need to be flexible in relation to those demands. We have seen an increase in consultants by 48.3%. An increase in training places by 5.7% of qualified nurses and midwives, with a further 2,600 training places being created by 2021, and an increased overall workforce growth of 9.5% since 2006. Currently, staffing levels are set locally by health providers. This bill does not seek to change this by prescribing the minimum staffing levels or fixed ratios. This legislation will continue to support local decisions, which is flexible and has the ability to redesign innovate across disciplinary and multi-agency settings. The issue of staffing levels is not new, and as the Royal College of Nursing states in their staff guidance, what is the optimal level of mix of nurseries required to deliver quality care as cost-effectively as possible? It's a perennial question. Further than that, in order to forecast the workforce required to meet further care needs, workforce planning also needs to consider a changing balance between types of care and the different models of delivery to be anticipated. This legislation will provide a constant process 
with validated workload and workforce planning tools which will help support our healthcare workers as they continue to provide, provide world-class care to patients. It is widely recognised that although it has been mandatory for health boards to utilise the tools and methodology since 2013, there are inconsistencies in the way in which the tools are applied and the extent to which the existing methodology is utilised to make informed decisions about staff requirements. Enshrining this process in law would help to ensure a more constant approach to staffing across all service areas and in turn contributing to better outcomes for patients and provide the public assurance that the right numbers of staff are in place to deliver personal centred care. I very much welcome the comments of Anne Gow, the Healthcare Improvement Scotland. During the committee's evidence session, she stated, it really shall not matter what the social sector people are looked after, they should be entitled to good care and high quality outcomes and to be assured that the right levels of staff will be in place to look after them. It is vital that we have the right number of staff with the right knowledge in the right place at the right time to provide safe and effective care. I'd also like to thank Helen Wright, NHS 5 Director, Executive Director of Nursing, for taking the time to share her thoughts about the bill directly with me, the most important people in the process of those that work in our health and social care services. It is imperative that the development of staffing methods are professionally led and are developed in a collaboration with the sector if we are to successfully deliver a robust, sustainable statutory framework. The safety of patient care must be paramount and we have to focus on delivering high quality care through a systemic and responsive approach for determining staffing levels. Having an effective and stable staff team is the backbone of delivering high quality care. An objective of Evans based statutory process, which builds upon the current model, integrated with professional human judgment, will better equip services with tools that are flexible and can take into account the varying needs of a sector without becoming an obstacle to either integration or innovation, therefore by restricting the opportunity of varying standards of care that exist across different services or indeed different areas of a service. A number of members have mentioned the difficulty in recruitment in the health and care social sector this afternoon. Therefore, I consider it important today to also highlight the current threat to health and social care sectors from Brexit. At this point, business as usual. Beyond next March, it is anything but certain as the invaluable contribution of EU workers all across Scotland being jeopardised by ill-conceived and short-sighted immigration policies of our UK Tory government. The figure shows that there are 26,000 people from the European Union working in health and social care, and I will do, in public administration in Scotland. Miles Briggs. Thank you. I'm grateful for the member to, for taking this intervention. The committee, as you'll know, also heard concerns around the policy of uh, p new recruits potentially being sent instead of into adult social care into uh, child social care and the impact on workforce planning that's had. We've also heard that Nicola Sturgeon and her spectacular error of judgment of cutting the number of trainee places is also impacted on our health service. Would you also like to maybe highlight these points as well? David I thank the member for intervention. Um, I think just now at Brexit is actually taking impact right now. When you see a UK transplant surgeon who's um, committed over a, um, a thousand uh, operations actually leaving um, because he cites Brexit as a the problem. And when you see specialised doctors dropping to an eight year low because of bre Brexit right now, um, we have real problems with it and problems will come in the future about it. Um, we have already seen that there's an important impact on recruitment and retention of EU nationals and as the Brexit shamble continues, it will have a very real and far reaching implications for health and social care. The contribution of EU nationals to our workforce cannot be underestimated. Both our health and social care sectors will face considerable shortfall if there is any restriction to EU migration and changes to residents' rights of EU nationals will have a significant impact on the sustainability of our health and care so so social care sectors. We all have a long relied on EU nationals across all areas of our healthcare system and as the demands upon our services increase, we will continue to need them in the future. It is a real, very real threat to the social care sector, which cannot be ignored as uncertainty hangs over adult social care, putting further stress on our services. In conclusion, presiding officer, I would like to thank everybody involved in their work and the committee and everybody who supported it, and I fully support the principles of the bill. Anna Sarwar, followed by Alex Neal. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I start by putting on record, like the Cabinet Secretary did and many other speakers did, our thanks to all our NHS and social care staff who continue to go above and beyond in increasingly difficult circumstances. 
Uh, so a sincere thank you to each and every single one of them. Uh, but our thanks isn't good enough. They need more. Uh, staff are clear and staff representatives are clear uh, that they feel they're under extreme pressure. They feel there are too few of them to deliver the, pair, the care that they would like to give to their patients. And they do fear that patient care is compromised due to a lack of staff. In short, they feel overworked, undervalued and under-resourced. And at the same time, while public appreciation for the NHS and its staff is rightly high, it is also the public's number one concern. So I'd like to say right at the outset that I accept that these are not problems of Jean Freeman's making. And she still does have to accept though that her government has been in power for 11 years and that she now does have the responsibility to fix these problems. So we do support the principles of this bill, but I do believe it needs major surgery. And I do also sincerely believe that if this was the Cabinet Secretary designing this bill at the outset, I think it would have been a very different bill uh, indeed. Um, she said that the work, this is about workforce load rather than workforce planning. I think both are interconnected. Uh, if you don't have adequate levels of staff, it means increased workload um, on existing staff. So what I'd like to see is for this bill to be more than just a PR exercise. I'm sure that's also an aspiration shared by the Cabinet Secretary. But we have to accept that this bill will give not one extra member of staff and doesn't itself solve the workforce crisis. Now, I know the Cabinet Secretary doesn't like the term workforce crisis, but I think we have to accept reality. We are 3,500 nurses and midwives short in our NHS, 540 allied health professionals short, almost 400 consultant posts short, 1 million stress days lost by NHS staff, 100 million pounds a year being spent on medical locums, 25 million pounds a year on private nursing agencies. We have to be honest. If that is not a crisis, then what is? So what this bill needs alongside it is a credible and deliverable workforce plan. It needs adequate training places. It needs a recruitment and retention strategy. We need to look at how we can bring the vacancy rate down. And we also need to look at how we can reduce pressure on existing NHS and social care staff and help boost their morale. But we've also got to accept a fundamental issue and problem. We can't magic up the people. 3,500 nurses or midwives, 540 AH, AHPs, 393 consultants uh, and more. In the acute sector alone, that is close to 5,000 people short. And if we add the social care sector, there will be many more thousands on top of that. We will simply not find these 5,000 plus people that we need right now. So we have to have an honest and serious conversation about what we can deliver, how we can deliver it and how we find the right skills mix to deliver an NHS fit uh, for purpose. Uh, I want to give some practical um, suggestions about additions that I'd like to see uh, to the bill. But first of all, can I emphasize the point that Alec Rowley made? This, this can't become like the Patients' Rights Act, which is all great in principle, we all agree on, um, but in reality, it doesn't fit the word guarantee. Um, and that's why I think this bill does require some serious amendments. Uh, first of all, around safe wards, I note that safe is no longer uh, part of the title or in the bill. But who actually decides if a ward is safe? What happens if a ward is not safe? And in the circumstance where a ward is not safe, the ward manager has a decision to make. They can't employ a member of staff straight away. They will turn to agencies more often than not. That, that means a risk in increasing agency fees. They can shut the ward, although I doubt that's what we want, or it means closing of beds. And in those circumstances, if a ward is judged as being safe but is in a difficult circumstance or is judged as being unsafe but continues to operate, that has some severe risks for existing NHS staff. And if you look at the Bawa Garba case in particular, staff are under increased pressure and are worried about the implications of an adverse incident happens and who is held responsible. So I think we need to define what is safe and we need to build into the legislation protections uh, for staff. We also need, I think, more robust data. So what data will be made available through this bill to allow greater scrutiny in this parliament, but also greater public um, scrutiny. Uh, I've already mentioned agency staff. Uh, I think this bill should go further. I think we should look to cap um, agency fees. I'm not talking about the overall amount uh, a health board can spend on agencies, because that will have unintended consequences. I'm talking about how much an agency can charge for a shift or how much you can pay out for a shift. Uh, let me give you some examples. We've already heard in the audit committee that there are examples of medical consultants being paid up to £400,000 in a single year. And we've already heard from Audit Scotland 
that the, on average, an agent's total time equivalent agency nurse costs three times the amount of a single uh, NHS nurse. So if you take that into connection, that's one agency nurse to three NHS nurses and one agency consultant to four NHS consultants. And I think the Cabinet Secretary should look seriously at whether we should have an amendment in this bill that caps how much an agency can charge for a shift and how much a, a, a health board can pay out for a single shift. I also think we need to go further about scrutiny and sanctions. What sanctions are there on, I don't mean financial sanctions, I'm talking about accountability on health boards. There should be written into this bill that health boards should have to publish if they fail to meet their obligations through this bill. And there should also be built into this bill a commitment from the, whoever the Cabinet Secretary is at any given time that if the bill is not, uh, the intentions of the bill aren't met, that the Cabinet Secretary will come to this Parliament and make a statement in detail why those, why those haven't been met and what steps the Cabinet Secretary is taking uh, to address them. Um, finally, I noticed my, my time. Um, I think there needs to be greater coordination with social care. Um, I accept COSLA's concern about social care being separate, but if we are truly to talk about integration, we can't isolate social care. We have to look at integration of health and social care. We have to be cautious that we don't go back to thinking about doctors and nurses and midwives, but recognise that we need a multidisciplinary team, particularly if we can't find the adequate levels of doctors and nurses. How do we build into this legislation a greater protection for the multidisciplinary team? These are all areas I think need exploration for the next time this bill comes to this parliament. Um, I hope that this will be an opportunity that the Cabinet Secretary works with other political parties to deliver a truly transformative bill so we can have an NHS fit for purpose for the future. Thank you. Call Alec Neil, followed by Bill Bowman. Much indeed, Deputy Presiding Officer. It's very good that we have a general agreement across the Chamber on the principles of this bill. And I think there's a wide recognition that the role of this bill is not entirely to solve the problem, but as the Cabinet Secretary rightly said, is an additional tool in the box to help solve the problem uh, in terms of planning uh, and implementing a workforce development plan. Can I just say there has been a lot of talk about acute services and about the uh, care sector, but we should emphasize that this bill also covers the primary sector, and that's extremely important. And it's important, A, because 90% of all the patient contact with the health service is through the primary care sector. But secondly, uh, we are planning quite rightly, and I think we have cross-party support in this, uh, obviously to shift the emphasis from acute care into preventive care and primary care and social care in the community. And a lot of this and some of the ideas came from Alaska. And the reason I mention Alaska isn't just because that was the source of quite a number of the current reforms in the primary care sector we're implementing, it's because in Alaska, they've carried out a very successful reform of their entire health service, uh, as a result of which they've actually ended up closing down some hospitals because they now provide so many services in the primary care sector that it has so much reduced demand on the acute sector that they no longer need the number of hospitals they started with. And that is clearly a good thing because it's never good to have to be treated in hospital. Your chances of catching infection and all the rest of it, even with a very successful patient safety program, is still a lot higher than it is in the primary care sector. And the point I'm making is that in planning the workforce, you don't just start by looking, you don't do it by looking at today's vacancies and saying this has to be the workforce plan to replace these people or find people for these vacancies. That's part of it. What matters is the demand forecast for the future profile of services that's going to be required. And we should base our workforce plan on our estimates of future demand, not existing vacancies. Alec Rowley. Alec Rowley. Thank Alec Neil for taking intervention and, and I'm aware of the Alaskan model because uh, Councillor Andrew Roger, who was on the NHS board in Fife for many years, has championed that. The difficulty, however, is that transformation of getting the resources into the community side, into the primary care, while still maintaining the acute side. And, and the idea that the government has that the money will somehow just go across and the demand will fall off hasn't happened. 
Does he agree that there needs to be some kind of bridging in place to actually resource community care much more to take the pressure off acute? Alex Neil. Very fair point. I would make two points. Number one, the set aside provision, which was in the integration bill, hasn't worked as well as it was planned to work. Uh, and we all know the reasons for that, but that was the intention. It was the kind of modern equivalent of the bridging fund used uh, when previously we were emptying the Victorian so-called asylums to treat people in the community for mental health uh, issues. Uh, but the second point is um, that clearly if we get every penny of the Barnet consequentials that we're supposed to get, as a result of the very substantial increase in health spending planned for south of the border, then I would imagine a fair proportion of that would go into building up the primary and community sector, care sector facilities that we need in order to shift that balance from acute into the primary and community care sector. Uh, but I absolutely take the point, and I think the set aside way of doing it hasn't worked as well as the bridging funding method that was used when we were modernising mental health services. And I'm sure that's something the Health Secretary will be looking at in terms of the future. But there is no doubt at all that we have to look at the profile of what health's going to be like in three, four, five, ten years' time. I mean, there's a brilliant project just been announced jointly between the Health Secretary and the University of Glasgow two weeks ago, a £15 million project in looking at how uh, artificial intelligence can improve uh, prevention and diagnosis. Now, part of that will be actually, uh, in some time in the future, the not too distant future actually, will actually be able to identify what disease people will have before they show the symptoms of having the disease. Now, the manpower requirements for that are completely different from the manpower requirements of the way we do that today. In fact, your first priority would be to get people who can operate artificial intelligence. Uh, and clearly at the moment, there is nothing in the workforce plan, I would imagine, for artificial intelligent engineers uh, and the like. So that's a very, very good example of where we shouldn't be thinking of a workforce plan in the narrow sense of filling existing vacancies. It needs to be about providing for the kind of 21st century leading edge health service that we are planning. And let me say, Scotland is ahead of the, uh, in the application of artificial intelligence and other associated technologies in, uh, as it applies to the health service. You know, I hear all the, the concerns and the moans and the groans on a daily basis, but sometimes we've got to actually start shouting about the things we're doing really well in Scotland and being ahead in these technologies is one of the huge benefits we have in our health service. And this 15 million pound project, I think will transform things even further. But that's how we've got to think about the workforce. The workforce in five years time, in terms of numbers, in terms of locations, in terms of job descriptions, in terms of uh, training requirements, will be completely different from what it's been in the last five, are 10 years. And I think we're all agreed that we need to plan accordingly. This bill is an additional tool for the health secretary and the health boards, including the, private, uh, the, the primary care and acute sectors to help us get it right. And I'm sure uh, that if we do it on the basis I've suggested, then we, you can never be absolutely accurate in workforce planning. Uh, anybody would tell you that, but as long as the direction of travel is right, then we can get it as close as damn it to right. Uh, Bill Bowman, followed by Bob Doris. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I welcome the Health and Care Staffing Scotland Bill in principle. However, it should be acknowledged that there are important points that should be raised and are being raised in this debate. I suspect I may repeat some of them. In its programme for government 2017-18, the Scottish Government committed to introduce a safe staffing bill during the 17-18 parliamentary year to deliver on the commitment to enshrine in law the principles of safe staffing in the NHS. These commitments resulted in the Health and Care Staffing Scotland Bill being produced to enable safe and high quality care 
by making the provision of appropriate staffing in health and care a statutory requirement, resulting in better outcomes for service users. The bill covers both health and social care services with the aim of ensuring more integrated workload and staff planning. This broader approach is noted as seeking to ensure there will be appropriate staffing to deliver high quality care, whatever the setting. It is important to be clear that the bill does not focus on national workforce planning as has already been mentioned. The bill includes, includes a focus on the development and application of workload planning tools aiming to ensure health and social care providers are providing adequate numbers of suitably qualified staff to provide safe and high quality services. The Scottish Government has overall responsibility for NHS workforce planning. However, it should be noted that the Scottish Government decide upon the numbers of most health service staff entering, entering training, but not necessarily those entering the allied health professions such as occupational therapists. The Scottish Government undertook two consultations on the proposals in 2017 and 2018, and the general feedback was that the proposals seemed too narrow and there was a fear that the focus and resources would be directed at nurses and midwives rather than at all groups such as occupational therapists, for example. Additionally, the proposals did not consider safe staffing in a system-wide way in the context of national workforce planning and training numbers, nor in the context of current workforce challenges. It currently does not provide guidance on how to identify, monitor and mitigate staffing risks in response to differing daily needs. Additionally, this must go further to strengthen the role of the nurse to make professional judgments in regard to staffing. The subsequent consultation on proposals that took account of earlier responses and focused on how the legislative framework would cohere across health and social care ran for four weeks in February 2018. Respondents felt that any new methodologies should work across health and social care, that there should be flexibility in how new tools were developed used and reviewed and that there should be recognition of the new challenges faced across sectors in recruiting and retaining staff. The Finance Committee also issued a call for views on the financial memorandum of the bill and it received several responses. The issues raised included lack of training costs, <coughs> costs associated with reviewing the staffing tool and costs to other social care providers. It is pertinent that we use all of our resources wisely and the goal of the Health and Care Staffing Scotland Bill should be to do just this. We can all agree that a well-researched and evidence-based staffing framework would be ideal to ensure that the right staff are helping the right patients. It would have a legislative framework for health boards that appears methodolo methodologically sound. This would include the use of, specific, of specified staffing and professional judgment tools, consideration of quality, local context and risk, and a requirement to report on how they use the tool and methodology when making decisions about staffing requirements. For example, what might be right in nine wells in my region might not be right for Stracathro. However, the bill provides no concrete examples of how legislation will actually achieve this. The Scottish Government claims that this practice is based upon methods implemented by nurses and midwives, yet fails to produce data that demonstrates the success of this method, which had, this method had with caregivers. If this bill were to be effective, it must call for constant reporting. This would not only maintain data to measure effectiveness, but also ensure that the guidelines are followed. It is important to consider how the bill will deal with the real problems of staff shortages and budget cuts in planning teams. There's been very little information about the costs of implementing these changes. The social care workforce is currently experiencing challenges in terms of recruitment and retention. We must be sure that the bill will not add further processes and pressures to a system already under strain or increase the reliance on agency staff and undermine the financial stability of the sector. A move to a new system will create new upfront costs before any of the promised savings can be realised. Although it is already the duty of health boards and care service providers to ensure appropriate numbers of staff, the guiding principle of the bill is acceptable. Having the right people, as has been said, with the right skills in the right place at the right time to ensure the highest quality of care and outcomes are delivered across health and social care is a principle we all share. The Scottish Government is undertaking a reform of the planning system 12 years after the last reform. However, it has been clear from the beginning that there are problems in planning caused by cuts to budgets and staff shortages. 
The Royal College of Physicians and the Royal College of Nursing Scotland both raise concern that staff shortages are a key issue. As others have commented, it is resources, not reorganisation, which they need. Thank you. The last of the open debate contributions is from Bob Doris. Thank you very much, presiding officer. Now, I, I've not been involved in the scrutiny of this at stage one. I don't, I don't sit on the health committee, but I did note that the policy memorandum says that the policy intention of the Scottish Government is to enable a rigorous evidence-based approach to decision-making relating to staffing requirements. Uh, and the stage one report notes that the overall aim of the bill is to ensure safe and appropriate care staffing levels based on a clear evidence-based methodologies uh, regard, regardless of setting. And I think those, those underlying principles we could all agree with this, af this afternoon. I certainly strongly associate myself with those in intentions. Um, some interesting parts of the stage one report that, that, that came to my attention, uh, recommendation at section 57, uh, which, which I'll read, which says, we believe that there must be more clarity on where accountability for the provision of appropriate staffing in health boards and care service lies. Whilst the policy memorandum advises it will rely with organisations, we believe unless there's a named accountable officer, there is a high likelihood, particularly in health board settings, for those at ward level to be held or feel accountable, and I think that's um, very important. Uh, I do note that the Cabinet Secretary has since said that clarity on the ground in NH NHS awards the country will be important, and I really welcome the assurances uh, to the committee uh, relating to that it would sit as corporate responsibility compliance with the Health Board, um, and also further notes that, for example, it would expect that the senior charge nurse would run the current adult inpatient tool. I'm not sure that's full clarity though, to be fair. Um, on the ground, there is no exact science regarding safe starving levels at any particular snapshot in time. I declare an interest, my wife is, is a nurse. Uh, clinical coordinators on the ground will use significant data more generally to determine required staffing at any given time. Uh, even things such as football games and large events in a city, for example, icy weather predicted and trends over the last few years, peaks and troughs in demand, whether that has safe staffing level implications for accident emergency units, for HDU, for ICU and beyond. Predicted demand and surge demand, that all has to be fed in to the mix. But depending on that demand, the complexity and the type of condition that nurses in particular often have to deal with, you see a regular transfer of nurses between wards. Uh, and you often uh, have to make a decision as a nurse whether it is safe to have a nurse transferred from your ward or not. You also, by the same token, as a nurse on the ground, might have to decide whether or not it's appropriate to take an additional patient into your ward. Do you have safe staffing levels to allow you to do that? Do you have safe staffing levels to allow, you to allow a nurse to go to another ward where they're experiencing surge demand? That nurse in charge is not always a senior charge nurse. Although I do appreciate the final decision would be taken by a senior charge nurse. So actually at every layer of the NHS organisation within hospitals, there are professional judgments been exercised. And at some point for corporate compliance, the buck does have to stop somewhere. And I think greater clarity around that would be required. There's some positivity around this as well, because when there's conflict between, say, a nurse in charge uh, saying to a senior charge nurse that they don't think it's advisable that they take an additional patient, for example, on that ward, or where the senior charge nurse might disagree with the board in relation to what professional judgment and safe staffing levels look like, that's an opportunity to review and revise and enhance the workload and the staff planning tools that exist. But I do think we need clarity about where responsibility sits. Um, I want now to turn to the, the care sector and I actually think this is a powerful extension uh, and it will strengthen the sector, particularly the third sector. Now, avid care homes in the third sector say to me and my constituents before that the national care home contract has been unfair towards them. They have asserted that it gives prefer preferential treatment to council care homes. Um, they say on occasions that services procured in the third sector in terms of social care aren't always funded as appropriately as a local authority setting might be. Surely developing and agreeing 
what a multidisciplinary skills mix would look like, yes, with professional judgment, but what that would look like uh, in the care sector would be a key strength in relation to that third sector, having those negotiations with councils and integrated joint boards. I think that's to be welcomed in terms of that level playing field across the care sector, irrespective of where care is delivered. But actually, most of all, just as a son whose mum was in, in a care home, and I was very, very fortunate, it was a wonderful care, care home. The building was old, but the staff were fantastic. Um, if you want to ask that question, feel empowered to ask the question in relation to, well, how do I know there's a safe staffing mix in here? And you're given some general reassurances that that's okay, that your mum or your dad or your brother or your sister has the suitable care and skills mix there. You'd have much better reassurance if you know there's a robust, there's a consistent, there's a reliable, there's an evidence-based safe workload planning tool to ensure the correct skills mix. That doesn't exist consistently across the country right now. So it's not just about empowering the care sector, it's about empowering staff in the front line to say, actually, we don't believe staffing requirements are sufficient and you have, to, you have to do better. But in the care sector in particular, it's about empowering families to make sure they're sure that their loved ones are suitably looked after. And I welcome the general principles of this bill being debated here this afternoon. Uh, we move to the closing speeches and I call David Stewart for around six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and I believe this has been an excellent debate with insightful and well-informed speeches from across the Chamber. And as a member of the Health and Sport Committee, I was present and took uh, active part in the questioning of all our witnesses, including the Cabinet Secretary. Um, so I feel I've got some background in this particular debate. If I could paraphrase the conclusion of our Stage 1 report, which many other members have mentioned earlier today, to paraphrase it, it was that no one can object to the guiding principles of the bill, which of course is about having the right people with the right skills in the right place at the right time to ensure the highest quality of care. And as we have heard earlier, uh, Labour supports the general principles of the bill, but as Monica Lennon, Anna Sawa and Alex Rowley made clear, there are of course areas of concern, which we believe if addressed could strengthen the bill. And the Cabinet Secretary, in response to the Health Committee Stage 1 report, I think, which I got this morning, uh, said that the bill is about workload planning, not workforce planning. Um, now, critics might argue that this is about how many angels can dance on the head of the pin. And many territorial boards in Scotland, such as my own in Highland, have a workforce crisis. And as Sauer talked about the consultant being employed for 400,000 uh, a year, a horrendous amount of money, which in turn fuels the flames of financial instability. So Scottish Labour believes that health and social care policy should be focused on achieving the best outcomes for people and protecting staff well-being. As Cosla have argued, the over-reliance on processes could make the bill just another bureaucratic box-ticking exercise. But I have heard the Cabinet Secretary say that she's bringing some amendments at stage two, and I believe other members will as well. So there is opportunities to strengthen the bill. I would also like to put on record that we need to learn lessons from history. Uh, as I've reported uh, when I spoke a few weeks ago about in our bullying debate in NHS Highland, we need to look at what the Francis report said when it looked at bullying and whistleblowing in the NHS England. It concluded that losing trained talent from the NHS led to inadequate staffing levels and poor quality uh, of care. So as we know from the stage one report, we have a set of 12 workforce planning tools have been developed for nursing midwifery. The committee, as the cabinet secretary will know, had a survey, and if I just quote a couple of the responses, uh, presiding officer, it said the tools were not helpful in community setting, they were time consuming, I'm not sure how the tools can help develop safe staffing um, for patients. And a third of survey respondents had received no training on how to use the tools and there was no consistency of how training was delivered. And as Audit Scotland said, there is a risk that the time taken to train affected staff could put extra pressure on the workforce and impact on services and quality of care uh, to patients. I, I think it's been a, a very useful a debate kicked off obviously by the convener of the committee, Lewis MacDonald, who talked about the constructive suggestions from the committee on a unanimous report, also mentioned the views of allied health professionals, which need to be listened to in this whole debate. And there was some evidence gathered, as the cabinet secretary will be aware, that perhaps the bill currently is too 
uh, process focused. Miles Briggs made, uh, I think, very, some very good points about the crucial point that is self-explanatory, which, of course, people are the most valuable asset in the NHS. And what will this bill do to those working in health and social care at the front line? And I think also mention the very useful RCN survey, which gave some very useful uh, raw materials to us all. And I think just about every member made the, the uh, obvious but point that has to be said that NHS staff go the extra mile every single day to help uh, patients. And my colleague Monica Lennon uh, talked uh, about the fact that, yes, we're living longer, but are we living healthier, particularly if you look at health inequality within Scotland, how a focus on outcomes is key, and made the very interesting point that if you look at the vacancy level in the NHS currently, it could fill two uh, moderate-sized hospitals. And Alison Johnson, I think, made a, an excellent point about the links from research between good, safe staffing and favourable health outcomes, and touched on the 4.5% uh, vacancy level for nurses uh, and for uh, midwives. And many members made at this point that surely the Scottish Government has a duty of care for the well-being of all staff. That may be mentioned in some legislation historically, but perhaps, uh, Cabinet Secretary, that may be an amendment for stage two that you look favourably from uh, the committee on. Um, Alex Cole Ham Hamilton started with a rhetorical question about is the bill needed and stressed the importance of protecting hard-working staff uh, on the front line and the key about getting the right balance of skills uh, and experience. And uh, Anna Sauer made a very interesting point, in my view, about whether there should be a cap on agency staff costs. It's something hopefully the Cabinet Secretary uh, will look at. And then, in conclusion, President Officer, in the very few minutes I um, got left, I was reading just the other day from the British Medical Journal, and Dr. Uh, David Oliver, who's a consultant in acute general medicine, said this, without adequate staffing in clinical roles, NHS performance will decline and services will become unsustainable. Morale will worsen and staff will leave or choose to do less, a vicious circle. So finally, as Nai Bevan would have said on that quote, um, you don't have to gaze into a crystal ball when you can read an open book. Thank you. Ryan Whittle, around seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Before I start, can I refer the Chamber to my register of interests in the, I'm a director of an IT company developing communication and collaboration platforms for sectors, including the healthcare sector, but I, uh, I'm not receiving any remuneration for this post. And also, I have a family member, close family member, working within the Scottish NHS. I think it's been a very good uh, debate today, uh, and an extremely important one, given the subject. I think initially when this, uh, this bill was brought forward, it was called uh, the, the safe staffing bill and, and the fact that the word safe has been dropped with all the connotations that that would have meant uh, uh, if the safe staffing bill level had not been met. I think uh, Anna Sawar mentioned this. I think if you, if you call it, the, if, if we're going to have levels of safe staffing by, by uh, default, you'll also have un -level, uh, unsafe levels of staffing. So I think uh, that probably tells you uh, how important this particular bill is. And, what it does do, though, is allow us to focus uh, on our healthcare professionals, uh, their health, uh, and the quality healthcare we then receive from the NHS. I think the guiding principles and overall purpose uh, is about really about reassuring uh, someone in hospital or in social care that they are receiving that safe and high quality care. I think also in bringing this bill uh, to Parliament there, there, or, or to Parliament, there was a concern within the committee. Uh, that the work that's uh, on integration of health and social care, which is already well underway, could be negatively affected by this bill. So I think the Cabinet Secretary, uh, for me, would, would like to reassure the committee uh, that this, this can be avoided. I think Edmund Mountain is right in his summation uh, that the welfare of our healthcare professionals, although mentioned in the bill, uh, I think Dave Stewart said the same thing, it doesn't state how this will be achieved. And given the ever-increasing demands on health and social care, uh, as the Cabinet Secretary herself uh, alluded to. Um, I think yet uh, uh, we in this side of the Chamber have consistently stated that when it comes to creating an environment where patient outcomes are a priority, looking after the health of our healthcare profession, professionals must be the very first step to consider. As Marie Curie uh, highlighted, safe, uh, staff safety and wellbeing contribute to a safe and high quality care. And such a bill will require to be underpinned by the appropriate technology. I think in taking the evidence in the committee, this was a thread 
that I was uh, keen to pursue because, presiding officer, my concern in this regard is that a replacement platform developed specifically to deliver on the objectives of the bill has not been addressed prior to the introduction of the bill. Yet developing appropriate technology is fundamental to the, the success of the bill's objectives. I think we were surprised that uh, setting up a, a, a review of the, the, the current tools had not been undertaken prior to the introduction of the bill to assess the efficacy of the tools. The starting point of any bill should be the consideration of the end objectives. And let's face it, uh, presenting officer, uh, the government hasn't exactly been particularly successful in rolling out technology. Uh, to be successful in developing technology, fully scoping the project with tight protocols is essential. And to me, understanding this step should have been a prerequisite prior to the bill's introduction. We also have a situation where the, a situation where the implementation of current tools is patchy at best. And I, was, I always, always enjoy Alec, listening to Alec Neal's uh, contributions in, this, uh, in these debates. And he's absolutely right. We have uh, wonderful technology companies in Scotland currently developing some fantastic products. Where we fall down, though, is, 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 is integrating that into the health service. We're not particularly good at that. So I think um, it, it, you know, the, 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 the use of these, these tools uh, 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 and the integration of those tools has to be considered. I think there's, there's certainly uh, um, in, um, sorry, the, 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 as it currently stands, the technology that I think the government is relying on is, uh, is for nurse and midwifery workforce tools uh, only, and they're bolted onto an existing platform, and that uh, is a recipe for confusion, and don't seem to deliver that patient uh, medical practitioner outcome focus. And I think, as Mel Briggs uh, spoke about in his uh, 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 speech, um, we, need to look, we need to be looking at outcomes versus process. And I think Cosla mentioned themselves, uh, and I quote, that they see the bill as focusing on inputs rather than outcomes. And indeed, the committee noted that the Scottish Government does not view outcomes being, uh, needing to be on the bill. So if out outcomes were pr primary objectives, then we would have allied healthcare professionals and occupational therapists, social care, all intrinsically, intrinsically woven into the software development before ever launching because an outcome-focused solution must involve that multidisciplinary team. It is inconceivable that any healthcare plan could be effective without our physiotherapists or radiographers or speech therapists or mental health practitioners, social care, healthcare professionals, and so on. So it's very welcome uh, uh, to, to hear the Cabinet Secretary suggesting that, uh, that, that stage two amendments will be put forward uh, uh, to address this, and we look forward to seeing and assessing those amendments. Um, I was pleased uh, to hear that NSS are undertaking work to procure a new platform to replace the SSTS platform, but that is being done without the development plan for the workforce planning tools required for that multidisciplinary team approach. There is a need for this work to be done in conjunction with the introduction of the bill if patient and staff outcomes rather than process are to be the main drivers. Of course, the danger of an, an unintended consequences of tools applying only to nurses and midwives uh, have been highlighted uh, by many across the chamber and they may squeeze out uh, those other disciplines uh, like the allied healthcare, uh, allied healthcare professionals, occupational therapists, social care, etc. Annie Wells highlighted the concerns of the sub third sector and given that the third sector, uh, a, th a third of the volunteer sector are already involved in social care, um, uh, they need to be persuaded and the SCDO did su suggest that there was no particular benefit coming from the bill. Also noting that the Law Society uh, mentioned that it is difficult to assess from the face of the bill whether the main policy objective of appropriate staffing will be met as the bill is largely a vehicle for more legislation to come. And the Charter Society of Physiotherapy warned that it is a danger that individuals are held, to accountable, are held accountable for not being able to provide safe levels despite circumstances being out of their control. Other sectors, such as the care sector, have raised similar concerns. And units in Scotland note that if the Scottish Government decide to proceed with this bill in a fashion that requires adherence, then the Scottish Government need to make clear who is responsible for delivering that policy. If they cannot clarify specific lines of accountability, then in some ways that bill, the bill will become redundant. And with regards to social care and the introduction of commissioners into the process, without them referenced in the bill, how are they required to adhere uh, to the guiding principles? Uh, presenting officer, I, I'm sure that all members across this chamber would agree uh, that the Scottish Government's objectives are not only laudable uh, but essential. But if the bill is to succeed, I think it's, it's true there's work to do. And in supporting this bill, 
at this stage, we recognise that the elephant in the room is, of course, the shortage of staff across all medical professionals. Unless we address that, then the, uh, the, 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 the potential of the bill will be eroded. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I call Jean Freeman to, to close this debate. We have a little extra time, so a generous 10 minutes should take us to decision time. Please, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I, I, along with others, believe that this has indeed been a good debate, which has encapsulated the complexity of the legislation and the importance of making sure it acts as an enabler for the development of more evidence-based, profession-led methods of assessing the workload associated with the delivery of care for the people of Scotland. Uh, I want to thank members, all members who have taken part in the debate and also take this opportunity to thank the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, the Finance Committee and, of course, in particular, the Health and Sport Committee again for their work to inform Parliament's consideration of the Bill. I also want to take this opportunity, before I turn to specific points members have raised, to thank our key partners across the health and care sector for their constructive engagement with us and for the considerable input to the Bill so far. I've listened very carefully to all the views that have been expressed. I'll return to this uh, later on before I conclude uh, and we'll continue to work with them to ensure that the bill delivers uh, what we want it to deliver. Let me turn, if I may, presiding officer, to some of the points that have been made. Um, even with the generous 10 minutes, I'm not going to be able uh, to cover them all. But let me say this before I, I start. Um, what we will absolutely do uh, after this debate has concluded, and I hope that Parliament uh, supports uh, the stage one of this bill, that we will then look very carefully at the, the record of this debate to make sure that all the points that have been raised are then carefully considered by me uh, on what we might do and will be dealt with when I come to the Health and Sport Committee to give evidence at stage two. Let me also say, uh, in terms of the stage two amendments, uh, I am absolutely certain that members across this chamber will want to bring forward amendments. And as was my approach in Social Security, I want to offer the opportunity to discuss those stage two amendments before they are finally lodged, in order that we can be sure where we can reach agreement that we do that in advance. I would hate us to be in a position where the government uh, agrees with the principle and the spirit of an amendment, but can't agree with it simply because some of the words aren't quite right in legislative terms. We managed that before. I am certain we can manage it again. I'm not seeking to uh, subsume everyone's amendments as government amendments, but I am seeking very clearly to work as hard as I can to reach consensus across uh, this piece of legislation, because I believe it is a piece of legislation whose principles we are all agreed on, whose importance we are all recognise, and what we all want to do is make good law that will actually aid us in the work that we have at hand. Can I turn particularly to some of the points that Lewis MacDonald uh, made in speaking on behalf of the committee, and I'm very grateful for the very considered report that the committee uh, has brought to this, uh, to our considerations and to uh, the uh, contribution that he made. Um, I take the point about the bill being too process focused at the expense of outcomes. Um, and I know that others have made it indeed, uh, COSLA has raised it as a concern. I don't believe that to be the case. Uh, I do believe that the outcome focus of, the, of uh, the point of this bill is recognized in it, perfectly willing to look at whether we can strengthen that to make that even clearer. But I can't actually understand the thinking that says that if we have evidence-based, robust approach and a clear methodology consistently applied across our health and social care sector, appropriate to those settings, that allows us to identify workload, that then allows professional judgment to be exercised to identify what staff are needed and skill mix is needed. That surely goes to the uh, provision of high quality outcomes for patients and staff. Now, if that is not clear enough, as I said, I'm very happy to look at that in some more detail. I'm grateful to Mr. MacDonald for uh, recognising the importance of rolling out excellence in care uh, and also to raising the point of monitoring and compliance. I think Anna Sawa made some uh, useful points in his contribution about how uh, the public and indeed this chamber, uh, as this bill 
is passed into legislation, which obviously I hope it is, and is enacted in the way in which people can be advised of the work that's going on and the results that are being produced and compare and contrast that to the work that goes on in terms of workforce planning and uh, recruiting and training appropriate levels of staff across all those areas. And I'm happy again, uh, as I said, to look at how we might strengthen that in the bill. I don't believe that the bill will uh, skew resources uh, from one set of tools uh, because one set of tools is ahead of the other. I think we've been very clear that uh, as uh, the tools are developed appropriate to individual settings in which we would look to see them put in place, uh, that, that uh, in those circumstances we will be working with the appropriate stakeholders to make sure uh, that that is appropriate for those community-based settings, although it is uh, currently the case that the existing tools do cover both acute and community. But I would take uh, Alex Neal's point very strongly that when we talk about the community setting, we're not only talking about social care, we are talking about the primary care setting as well. Um, one of the questions that was raised, yes. Yes. Anna Sauer. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for taking intervention. I, I realise she can't go through all the requests that were made, but can she specifically respond to the point around looking at a cap on agency fees and charges? Jane I'm, Freeman. I'm getting there, Mr Sauer. I'm getting there. You trust me. Um, on the question about how does this differ from why do we need legislation as opposed to the current mandate, let me just say that one of... Uh, uh, those who contributed, actually, I think it was Mr Stewart, made it very clear why we need to move from a mandate to legislation. And that is, we have the mandate, but we don't have sufficient training. We don't have time for training. We don't have for support for staff. We don't have support uh, to ensure that the information that is produced is analysed and then applied. And the legislation will allow us to do that. And in terms of who is accountable, well, the, uh, for healthcare, um, the, uh, the bill, if passed, will add to the 1978 uh, National Health Service Scotland Act, uh, which then makes that a duty uh, for uh, the health board to be accountable. That health board includes the chief officers of IJBs and for the care inspectorate, um, similarly, their existing powers would apply. So I think the issue of accountability can be answered, although I'm happy to discuss that further. Let me turn to the point be before we run out of time about a cap on what agency charges are. I agree with Mr. Sawar um, in full that the current situation that he gave examples of is unacceptable. I am not certain that we have the powers uh, as a government to do what he asks in terms of capping it, but I am very happy to continue to discuss that further with him and with his colleagues to see what more we might do. Certainly the application of this legislation should lead to uh, a continued reduction in agency requirement and agency spend. And I would make the point that it is in the current year down 7% from what it was previously, but the application of the legislation should allow us to drive that down even further. But I am happy uh, to look at that. And can I just take the opportunity to thank Mr. Sawar for his contribution and um, for being able to say, here are the things we think are, are wrong with the legislation so far, how it could be strengthened, and then offering very concrete uh, suggestions for it. I need to make the point about Brexit. I am not standing here and saying that our current uh, issues around recruitment and retention are exclusively down to Brexit, but Brexit will exacerbate the problem that we have. There is no question of that, but so too will immigration uh, legislation that does not meet the particular needs of Scotland and the Scottish economy and the Scottish population. And that is why the whole area of immigration powers are ones that need to be seriously considered about coming to this parliament and not simply residing in Westminster where they are skewed. Yes, of course. David Stewart. The Cabinet Secretary will be well aware of the UK government changes, I think, just this week, which has doubled the non-EU NHS levy that has to be paid to staff, which will affect the health service in Scotland. Has the Cabinet Secretary been in the assessment of the effect that's going to have? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I can't think it will be a good one, um, but I haven't made it yet in detail, but I'm happy when we have done that to uh, let Mr Stewart know uh, what that might, uh, how that might add to the difficulties that we are facing. Um, the, the final point I think I want to make, presiding officer, 
is in terms of um, what Mr Mountain and others said about looking at well-being in terms of uh, this particular <coughs> piece of legislation. Again, I'm very happy to look at amendment, an amendment that may strengthen that area and to discuss that further. We need to be careful that we do not stray into health and safety or employment legislation, because that is, of course, reserved and we couldn't do that. But I'm very happy uh, to look at, at that. My last point before I conclude, presiding officer, is to say I, I really don't think it is either or in terms of uh, assessing workload and workforce planning. And we shouldn't do, wait for one to be got right before we do the other. The two need to go hand in hand. But I believe that this bill further strengthened at stage two, undoubtedly, will significantly contribute to our capacity to increase the performance of our workforce planning, its efficacy, and from that, the numbers that we uh, support and, and uh, require in training across a whole range of professions. Finally, let me say, presiding officer, I am, as I always am, very open to further conversations as we go into stage two to looking to see how far we can reach consensus on this important piece of legislation. There will undoubtedly be areas where we disagree, but I am certain with goodwill from across this chamber, we can get a piece of legislation that is not only fit for purpose, but is fit for the needs and expectations of the people we serve. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And that concludes our debate on the Health and Care Staffing Scotland Bill. The next item of business is consideration of motion 14969 on the financial resolution for the Health and Care Staffing Scotland Bill. Could I call on Derek Mackay to move the motion? Thank you very much. And the question on this motion will be put at decision time. The next item is consideration of business motion 15076 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a revised business programme. Could I call on Graham Day to move the motion? Thank you very much. Uh, no member seems to wish to speak against the motion. Therefore, the question is that motion 15076 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. Thank you. And we turn now to decision time. There are two questions today. The first question is that motion 15055 in the name of Jean Freeman on stage one of the Health and Care Staffing Scotland will be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the final question is that motion 14969 in the name of Derek Mackay on a financial resolution for the Health and Care Staffing Scotland will be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. I close this meeting. <laughs>